Ian, th thanks a million for, for joining me. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. No problem. My pleasure. Um, we, we'll cut straight into it. Did, did you see? Um, well, sorry. We'll we'll, we'll get into your, your career and stuff. There's been plenty to talk about. Did you see that very recent documentary called Secret Army? It was actually a, it was actually a document okay. a, about a documentary. Um, and and I wanted to ask because you you've always held the contention that um that Martin McGuinness was like an informer agent of some kind. I was I was wondering if this swayed your your view either way. No, it didn't, because my contention of that was predates. I mean, my first um, uh, reference to Mark McGuinness as being uh, an agent um, dates back to the best part of 20 years. So I don't come to this party, you know, quite late on. But I was aware of Dara's investigations over the previous... I mean, they've been going on for a couple of years now. Um, so I, I was aware of it. Um, and... Clearly, the uh, video uh, would be a a treasure trove of uh, for any intelligence agency, and and I use that term any intelligence agency, irregardless whether it's Angadi Shia Corner, uh, whether it is um, uh, the Fro, the IUC, uh, or six at that stage, because back in those days. Uh, five wasn't a um, uh, a real um, live um, operational unit in the in the in the province. Uh, and pardon me, I, I know I will cause offence when I say the word province, but you can substitute the six counties equally because I have and always will be as objective as I can be. I tend not to try and take sides, so I'm equally comfortable with six counties as I am with the province. Um, but to, to answer your question, um, my um, uh, my belief was born from a personal experience in how our case uh, was initially directed by uh, senior pro officers in regards to the Franco Egerty case, and and how that case progressed through. To um, to essentially being a culmination of being in a position to recover the largest ever shipments of Libyan arms ever undertaken by any agency, whether that is six five uh, the IUC and Garda Shia or anybody else, and and that was an absolute um, uh, first class wicket taking. But how we arrived at that. Uh, would uh, was always in my mind a a clear indication that the pathway was not um, uh, was not a circuitous one, and uh, it, it was a relatively straightforward pathway, and that always raises uh, in a, in a, in, an, in an intelligence uh, capacity your your antenna is raised. Uh, when you are giving um, instructions which are clearly not um, uh, natural, uh, nor uh, <laughs> nor believable, and then you know suddenly you go from zero to hero in in, in, in a relatively short period of time. We are talking the best part of three years, but but nonetheless, it, it, you know that to to. To arrive at a position when you have a previously compromised sticky agent um, uh, and to then be watched the development of that agent through to being essentially 2IC of Northern Command, Pyro and receipt of the largest ever shipments. And that in itself is not... It, well, it's it's unique as far as I am aware uh, in the context of Northern Ireland. So, so for that to happen, um, it, it's um, I would it, I would suggest it's incredulous. The way I was privileged to be involved in the early elements of it and to watch throughout to his ultimate um, his ultimate uh, passing. And bear in mind that I was also involved in the resettlement of him um, when he, his original compromise had taken place.
Um, the pe pe people, um, people do make a lot of that decision of Martin McGuinness to um to to put Franco in charge of the that that biggest that biggest um uh, arms hall. I, I I've heard it compared to like like bringing the ball boy on and, and and making him captain of the team. You know. Yeah. Um. Well, I will, and again, just to evidence that I'm not coming to this party late on. I remember um, uh, having a radio discussion, but I think they were called Radio Free Air and back in the very early 2000s and having a discussion with Eamon McCann, who you, you, you probably know is a, a leading journalist from uh, Left Wing Journal in, in Derry. And I raised that very issue with him about uh, Martin McGuinness and I asked him um, whether... Um, he was aware that he was a previously compromised agent, which he confirmed he was. And he then expanded upon that by saying every Tom, Dick and Harry in, in Derry knew that he was. Uh, and then I asked him for the rationale for anybody to essentially um, take him under his, uh, the wing and sponsor him all the way through to his ultimate role of 2IC of uh, Northern Command. Uh, in the quartermaster capacity, and he uh, was very succinct in his answer, which was that uh, he could provide no rational explanation for that. And unfortunately, the only person that could um, offer that uh, rational explanation, unfortunately, is no longer with us. But I did make the offer to him while he was alive to debate this issue, and Mr McGuinness uh, politely declined that offer. But I, I'd, I'd made more than one overture to him um, and um, as is its prerogative he decided that uh, that wouldn't have been uh, in his interest um so so if, if if that were to be true it would mean that martin mcginnis who uh, i i think people people who, who regard him as as a, an agent or informer usually say he worked for mi5 so that would mean that no no but five were not five were not involved in an operational capacity. Again, this is another, um, I, I, I'd like to take this opportunity of, of um, dispelling some urban myths which are absolutely not born from any facts. Okay, so it, it, in regards to five, um, five were not operationally competent throughout the 80s and through to the early 90s. And when I say operationally competent, uh, they um, were not geared up to have any uh, meetings, uh, uh, pick up drop offs in a um, in an operational environment. They weren't trained um, to um, be in, in any offensive way. Um, and and to evidence, you know, I'll give you one piece of evidence in that regard. So thirty or seven, which was Willie Callan. Um, Michael Bethany was a five agent who was a also a Russian agent who ultimately uh, subsequently blew Carlin's cover uh, whilst he was in jail. Uh, but during the period that he was um, the co-handler, and he was the co-handler for a very short period, um, we had to do all the pick-up and drop-offs for him because five didn't have the infrastructure. It takes a lot of manpower and a lot of skill to basically pick up and secure on a long-term basis the physical security of the agent and the handlers. I mean, it is, you know, I mean, you, you're looking at um, at least four vehicles and potentially at least eight people who are involved in, um, and they have to be experienced, it's not, you know, you can't just pick somebody off the street to go and do that sort of cover job. And they have to be proficient and um, and used to um, operating in an adversarial, um, whether it's in the bog side or whether it's in Port Stewart or wherever it may be, or, or, or indeed whether it's in, in the Republic. Um, because if you listen to General Wills, he admits... Uh, when I challenged him on this point, um, yeah, I've got the video. I've got uh, uh, 
pictorial evidence of me and a, a, another pro agent in uh, on uh, in Balishana Nambundoran. Um, so in 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 that sort of activity could not be undertaken by uh, people who weren't at, at, at that stage. It's slightly different now because uh, they did in the in the early nineties they took on a lot of ex pro and they then became um, competent in dealing with the uh, an hostile environment. Uh, so in other words, uh, sorry. Who 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 do you reckon um who who do you reckon was running him in, in that case? I, I I honestly don't know. That's the truth. Um I, I genuinely and honestly don't know. I'm I'm a hundred percent certain it's not true. Uh, I'm hundred percent certain it's not the RUC. Um, so the the two the two options um, either Angada Shirkona or Six because Six had primacy in the very so the the period that we that the video is is uh, Six were uh, did have um, uh, primacy um, and and just to come back to finish off with five. Um, Again, I'm on record with this. Uh, so in the uh, 12 company offices, uh, we used to answer, out of hours, we answered the phone calls for both uh, five and for the rattle. So because neither of them were uh, manned sufficiently to the point that they could provide 24 hour cover. So the, the original compromise uh, in regards to steak knife about the um, uh, about the drunk driving, the, the DUI, uh, was a phone call to 12 company uh, out of hours uh, duty operator. So, so, and again, the same thing happened with five. Well, they had a relatively, um, I mean, there was there was probably about six uh, six entries in a book, and we would know who then to pass on messages to. Um, so, but they they were, you know, it was clear that. It was clear that they weren't operationally competent in in the north. Um, they preferred the airports where people had to go through security screening, both in Dublin and uh, in Belfast or in London. And and that I understand why they did it. You know, I'm, I'm not knocking them, but I, I just want to demolish the fact that Five was not a an agency which was operationally. Um, uh, adding to the the overall intelligence collection. Okay, very good. I get you. Cool. We'll we'll get into um we'll we'll get into like your own story now. Um, how was it that you came to be um a member of um of this kind of uh, army unit? Well, it's not. I was a member of the intelligence corps. So the fru itself is is roughly sixty forty percent. So sixty percent intelligence corps. So, and 40% other arms, whether they be, you know, Royal Marines, paratroopers, whatever they're, but they all have to undergo the same course. Um, so, so essentially the through course is, um, it, 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 it is just a, another, I mean, the intelligence course, it has two elements to it. Um, one is the crypto, so the languages, the, the interceptions of uh, SIGINT and that sort of thing. And then you have my side, which was the operator intelligence. So the people that would um, essentially, that their, their career is about analysing intelligence collection, the dissemination of that, the production of, of that into a um, uh, turning raw in information into intelligence. Because intelligence is not... Uh, it is the result of information which is then turned into intelligence by means of bringing collateral um, reports into the equation. It, you know, you, you know, it's the same. With, you know, people like state now. State, you know, individual agents don't operate in a vacuum. There are other agents and other forms of intelligence collection tools. For example, ELINT, SIGINT. Uh, which also then factor into um, the... So if we were trying to verify a piece of information, we would look at a range of intelligence sources, 
not just you mint. Um, and that's how you arrive at, at the at the grading. That's how you know somebody is reliable and and the information is is um, um, uh, and the and, and the the viability of the agent over a long term. He doesn't arrive at B two, you know, over six months. He arrives at B two over a number of years, and collateral has confirmed his information from from other sources. Um, how, how was it that you um? That you even came to a, a place where, where you wanted to be to be to be part okay. of. Okay, so so I mean I, I had a slightly circuitous route, and I think I do cover it in the book. Um, so I I I failed my first. Um, I was originally in Squad eighty five, in uh, in the intelligence corps, and I we can well, I completely flunked it along with one other guy, and. Uh, the rest of those that floated were, were asked to leave, but me and him were basically asked to stay on. And we did, and we eventually then were um, allowed back onto Squad 89, so four squads later. And by that time, we were a lot more uh, clued up as to, you know, we were relatively young at that stage, immature, and we knew a lot more of what we needed to do. Um and I think I do allude to this into the book about how we we, we cheated um, to get through that course. And um, we broke into saves, we broke into desks. Um, we, and, and we and we essentially, both me and, and that, that lad, um, uh, went on to become uh, top and second top. So I had the choice of posting, and uh, my choice was to... Uh, for Belfast, well, for, for Northern Ireland. And he got second choice and he went to Germany. Um, and then um, our career paths did eventually pass. Um, but ultimately, it, was a, a, it wasn't a straightforward uh, case. So if you take the other cases, like the famous Mike's case, uh, she was on my original Squad 85 in the Brian Nelson case. Um, so... Uh, and she was top of that class. She she was there, there was no um, you know that there was no uh, no doubt about her uh, in in that sense. But in my case, um, uh, there was a slight blip in that in that path. But once we get to Bel once I get to Northern Ireland, I then um, I join um, a, a, a unit called Three SCT, which is like a blood in in exercise they're called a special collation team and all the newbies going to this and, and what we are essentially doing in that uh, in that uh, unit is uh, taking all the IUC intelligence and putting it onto the army's uh, database in a, on what's called a level one situation so we were stealing all their intelligence and putting it into ours but without the IUC knowing uh, and they would never have had access to it because it was all at level one. Again, I, I've gone over this previously. And then we I then move after three months. So everybody's in the, it's a boring job. So everybody moves after three months. I get the job in one two one intelligence section, which is across the road in headquarters, Northern Ireland. And our job is to service the needs of G2 staff and the general. So the five-star general and his staff. And, uh, and and again, that's the area where we, out of hours, the duty operator would answer the calls for both the rattle and uh, and for five. Who, um, excuse me, who are those? The rattle? Yeah, the rattle. So the rattle is where State Knife was run from. Because that, that's a very small unit. Um, you would only have um, uh, two handlers in theatre at any one time, a collator. And um, I think they had a whiz employee for a certain amount of time. So a maximum of four people. So they could reasonably be expected to man the phones for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they had to be um, reallocated um, in the same way fives were uh, to the uh, uh, to the duty operator 125, which is literally one porter cabin above. So there was just, you know, they were on two, um, you know, they were rudimentary porter cabins which had been converted and uh, a set of stairs where the, the rattle 
i.e. stay knives, handlers would, would operate. And they would come up stairs and use our, uh, that is, uh, our 3702 computer terminals to do any research. And they would task us to do jobs. But at that stage, this is obviously prior to the DUI, um, none of us in there were aware of the, uh, we knew the source they were running because we saw his product. Uh, that is his uh, miser products, but we didn't know his identity. Um, and and then from once the compromise had taken place, um, then then clearly um, I was in a position to have that knowledge, and my uh, I'd moved from the loyalist desk in one in one two one to the Derry desk, and a position had come up in Derry for a collator. And uh, the then uh, CEO of the crew uh, basically asked me if I would be uh, willing, and and it was an opportunity, which you know was <laughs> was what you were looking for, um, and um, and so I went to work in in the dairy office, and that's where um, I first come into contact with the, the dairy agents, and um, and then from then. Um, everything progresses through. Um, this was a, this was when remind us that the FRU was formed, I believe, in nineteen eighty. So the the FRU was formed in nineteen eighty, and it, and again, let me just correct one of the um, and again, it's it's a correction. I'm not alleging anything here, but the difference between the FRU and the FRO. So some one of your previous contributors um, said that there was. Uh, a change in the legal status, and it wasn't. The, the force research unit is the unit en masse. So each of the offices is a, a forward research office. So you would have floor north, which is Derry, floor south, floor east, uh, and then that would get then changed to east, uh, south, uh, west. Uh, so so it, 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 it is basically the all the offices. So the unit is the force research unit. And then you have the individual offices throughout the um, uh, throughout the province of like six counties. So, um, so, so to explain that that's how it works. And in Derry, uh, there was a subdivision at that stage to uh, Saint Angelo, which was uh, in an, uh, just outside of Enniskillen. Um, so, uh, essentially, um, throughout my first tour in for, in. Uh, Derry. Um, I think I may have gone to St. Angelo once, but the majority of my time was as a collator in Derry. And um, that's where they um, invariably, the those that are brought to it as a collator would then be assessed whether they are of the uh, cal calibre or calibre of people that they would want to subsequently train to be handlers. So the way that that is done is you um, you blood those people uh, as I was uh, on people like um, Frank Hegarty, who was, as I say, a compromised source and had no real intelligence value right at, at, at that stage. He was purely eyes and ears and probably met once a month at that stage. And there was a you know whole host of other little agents that we used uh, to cut our teeth on. And, and interestingly, 30 or 7, which is Willie Carlin, was also included in that um, that type of um, agent at that time. He produced um, very little of value uh, at that stage. So there's so as Casey developed, as in 30 or 7 on 3018, Hegarty, and that's all to do with the direction and the development of an agent in regards to how a handler um, uh, develops an agent and how that progresses. And you you, you joined when? Was it 82 or so? No, I, I joined uh, Derry in 81, uh, through Derry in 81. Okay, so very good. Go to, so I go to the, uh, the province in late 80. Um, and sorry, yeah, so a very early uh, 81, sorry. And then, but I'm redeployed within six months to Derry, and I'm in theatre until um, I was in Derry until 
84, uh, late 84, uh, and uh, and then left and come back in uh, just after the Enniskillen bomb as a handler. Uh, but I'm then assigned back to, again, still comes under Derry, but um, but, but essentially in, uh, in Fermanagh, in San Angelo, after the, after the Enniskillen bomb, where we needed to get more coverage. Um, the, a, a lot gets made of the a, a very early unit in the troubles called called the MRF. Um, they, they were kind of known for, um, like 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 even even British, uh, a, a lot of military people wouldn't view them favorably, and they they say they kind of went, went yeah. Let, let me explain that. So so essentially, any organization prior to nineteen eighty eighty is when the decision to bring in the actual intelligence trained people. So the intelligence corps is not deployed in any substantial way. There were no FINCOs, there were so field intelligence non-commissioned officers. Um, so that they weren't um so they were local units. So you know if you've got the Devon and Dorsets or the Royal Marines, uh, they had their own local IOs. And uh, in the case of you know the, the so-called Peter Jones case, um uh, where um I think was it Devon Dorsets, I think off the top of my head, um, or uh, Royal Anglians, they all had their own and they all did their own thing. The MRF was like a composite of it, but they weren't um they weren't professional intelligences. That wasn't their career path, it wasn't their training, it wasn't their experience. But clearly as the as the um, troubles developed, it was clear that we needed to have or the should I say our um, our seniors, so our, our political masters and our uh, five star general, the GOC, who is ultimately um, the, the the senior uh, senior uh, soldier within the uh, the province, and the head of special branch. Um, there was a dearth of exploitable intelligence. Now. When you bring in um, professionals or professional intelligences, then it's how you develop a case and you see the value of somebody and how you can exploit that. And that's the skill set that was was brought in. And you can see throughout the progression of the trouble. So if you take, say, from 1980 through to when the first seeds were being sown of the Republic of Movement making overtures that we, we've had enough here, we ain't going to win, and we're getting battered, which was late 86, early 87. That's the first overtures you see coming through. Uh, essentially, that was at that point um, that they realised, um, you know, they weren't going to win militarily, and they and they were, colloquially, they were fought. But you had two parties within the Republican movement, which were essentially um, at, at loggerheads and how you would bring it to uh, to a conclusion. You had the Ivor Bell um, uh, faction and um, and you would have the Adams uh, and McGuinness faction, which were uh, essentially uh, two separate strands, for, for want of a better um strand and um the only way you were going to bring the gra the, the root or the, gr the the grassroots of the republican family with it was to essentially lie and prevaricate which is what both adams and mcginnis did and, and there was good reasons for that uh, because they knew if they'd been open about you know that we you know because of the level of penetration because of the the, uh, the lack of being able to uh, operationally be effective um, on a scale, uh, you know, we are going to have to bring this to some sort of um, controlled landing. That's not going to get done overnight. And it was done, you know, I mean, a lot of Republicans look back now and they can see the, 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 uh, the timeline, as we would call it, and um, and if you read Rich Yours Raw's book, you know, a lot of those people um, were um, 
you know, a lot of them would have come from a militant arm. And once lock all takes place and they get rid of, you know, the gym liners of this world, um, the incidents down in Fermanagh, uh, when they take out people like Seamus McIlwain. Um, and the, the the heart of the movement is is knows that it is compromised and therefore it's destabilised. And, it, and it's not an effective fighting movement which is likely to be able to... We have the ascendancy because and only because of the value and the quality of intelligence which was being returned. I mean, yeah, yeah. again, just to people like Frank Hegarty, to be able to bring, I mean, bear in mind, he, it wasn't the first shipment that he'd compromised. And, and when those compromise, when those shipments come, the previous ones, they'd all been jarred, so electronically tagged. So we, we, we knew where they were. We knew how, you, 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 that's the sort of thing you want. As an intelligence, you want to be able to run a operation. You don't want to, you know, I mean, the reason that that was, the, the, that, that, shipment was done was purely political because of the Anglo-Irish agreement and Garrett Fitzgerald being signed. Um, but no, the, the handlers in those cases would not have agreed to, you know, were not in favour of that. But that's, you know, that's a decision taken way above um, handlers' pay grade. Um, the, the MRF were kind of well known for, they, they did like a bunch of different things, intelligence gathering being one of them. But one of them was like they acted as like a, a kind of a roaming hit squad um, on the lookout for well-known IRA yeah. people, they often um, they, they often shot civilians who who they said absolutely, absolutely. They they were indisciplined. They weren't organised as an uh, as a as as in a military context. They weren't getting the, you know they they were there as um, well. If you want, they they were a um, they were a recruitment sergeant. Um, you know, essentially, and and, I, and I'm going to be, you know, a lot of your listeners won't believe this, but, uh, but from a fruit perspective, uh, we were objective. 99.9% uh, .9 of all fruit operators, um, you know, we, I would, I would, I would, we targeted both loyalist and, and Republican, but, you know, there was no, there was no bigotry. There was no, um, um, there, there was nothing which was, you know, that we had to, um, attack a take for want of a better word where I think prior to 1980 uh, the Republican movement was uh, was seen as the big ogre and um, the collusion which undoubtedly happened with uh, within loyalism and the RUC and elements of the British Army was co uh, was uh, corrosive and uh, was essentially the fuel that was uh, perpetuating the, the the troubles, uh, for want of a better word, um, and and that had to stop, and that did to a certain extent stop. You still saw incidents, you know, like fourteen company incidents, which um, were um, I'm thinking of the um, the Sean Quinn bookies and the um, and, and a few other incidents where um, there were, let's say, contentious, um, and same with two to SES incidents. But the the difference there is they were involved in an operational environment where they actually engaged with the enemy, so you could perceive there was a life threatening situation. In the case of the fru, that wasn't the case um, because, you know, we had control of the environment. But with um, with those organisations you're talking about, they actively looked for confrontation. And w was there any degree uh, within the, the FRU of, like, um, hit squad or, or kind of snatch? No. I, I, I've heard, I, I have heard... Um... The, the group that uh, apparently the motto was like, like fishers of men. I, 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 well, the fishers of men is that we fish for people. Yeah, so we will fish for that, that is the core motto of the intelligence corps, it's not and 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 the fruit in specifically. But my point is, it that's exactly what we did. We fish for 
uh, as a handler for a recruitment, those people that we thought could present us with an opportunity to develop intelligence on the the threat. The threat was to society. I mean, I mean, I can you know, I'll speak for myself here, but you know, my job was to mitigate the threat to society, not you know, target Republicans, not to target loyalists, but the threat to society. Now. How you do that is is by in, intercepting large shipments of, of Libyan arms shipments. You don't want service to air missiles. You don't want Barrett's. You don't want, you know, high caliber material getting in and and accentuating the troubles. Uh, if you could escape, if you if you'd have had service to air missiles coming in and they were taking out civilian airliners coming in from um, you know, from uh, Alder Grove, you, you'd have been you know, you'd have been on a dimension of, you know, it's a scale of 10, what, what the troubles were previously. You know, and equally, you know, if you'd have had loyalists going down to, to the Republican taking out, um, you know, high-profile targets, those, are, those, those needed, you needed to be able to control all elements within um, all threats. And, and, and therein lies that problem. And it is a problem, um, and because when you essentially have control over um, the protagonist, whether that is INLA, whether that is um, the, the Republican movement, or whether that's loyalists, I mean, I don't think anybody doubts um, the, the control we had over loyalists. And, and again, to exemplify that, if you think back to the evidence Sir John Stevens gave to Parliament, um, and there's a YouTube you can you can um, happily supply you the court here, and he he said uh, 214 people that were arrested in his investigations uh, into loyalism or to Brian Nelson case only four were not agents of at least one or more agencies. Wow! And that's the, that's the thing you've got to remember here. You know the level of penetration. And so the knowledge base was pretty damn good. And, and that's what allowed, I mean, you, you could make the allegation uh, that, you know, ultimately it was an effort to degrade all protagonists by attacking, by using the resources we had to attack each other. Um, I mean, you're aware of the, you know, the no strike agreement between loyalists and Republicans. So, you know, <laughs> loyalists would agree their top 20 and, and Republicans would agree their top 20. You wouldn't, they wouldn't target each other. I mean, you know, who gives a fuck about the average volunteer on the ground for both organisations? But that's what happened in the dirty war. You know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot out there which essentially um, undermined um that period of the troubles. You, you said, um, I, I think you said in the book that the uh, the FRU didn't um, didn't look to recruit loyalists, and and that Brian Nelson was the exception to that. No, no, the the FRU has a has a remit to recruit loyalists, and again, I'm glad you mentioned that. Right, but the there are a couple of exemptions to to it. So, um, in first and foremost, with any Republican or loyalist. Uh, that uh, the free would seek to recruit, uh, you first need to gain the permission of the head of special branch. The head of special branch, the head of the RUC or their intelligence collection tool, uh, has to give us permission to, to, to mount our recruitment. So uh, the exception to that is where a, uh, a person or a person that you're looking to recruit has been a soldier. Now, whether that's a soldier who is currently in the Republican movement, I'll give you one example of that, Peter Keeley, or a soldier who was um, in the um, in loyalism by Brian Nelson, and and again, people like Brian, uh, um, Willie Carlin, who was again a former soldier uh, within the Sinn Féin uh, setup. So. They they were the exemptions to it, but you know we had. Let me give you. We had in Derry, 
in my early, in my period, we had a walk in a very very senior um, person within royalism in 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 the northwest, and when we applied to he he's a total walk in was wanted to work for us, and when we um, made that application, it was denied. Um, now, you, you know we can all. You know, we can all guess why, um, and it, it's not beyond the possibility that he was trying to milk two or two agencies. Uh, but nonetheless, if if a another agency was running him, I you see, um, were they getting best value out of him? I doubt it. Would we have been a better option? In my opinion, yeah, because we were professional intelligence. None of the IMC that you know one day they could be in CID. Day they could be in branch. They weren't, in, and you, you only have to look at their body count. You know, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have developed any cases like Frank Hegarty, for example. You know, they, if you look at any of their cases, none of them were developed to, to that, and they had a far greater attrition rate. Um, now, I would say that. I would say we were a better option, uh, but nonetheless, I, I truly believe that. And there are, again, if you look at, say, I think Phil Smith's book, Fishers of Men, if you read that. Um, incidentally, I'm shorty in that, in that book. But if you read that, he, he uh, outlines a case where um, the, the branch in Fermanagh wanted to recruit a very, very high-profile Republican down there. But they didn't, they'd assessed uh, that his motivation would be purely financial. Uh, but they didn't have access to the funds that we did. Um, we always had a serious amount of money on the, within the office, but we could literally have a helicopter down within a couple of hours with, you know, unlimited funds, you know, half a million within within a period. Um, and so so... The branch, the local branch, approached us, approached Smith, uh, Phil actually, and um, and and it was agreed, and we had an agreement from our bosses. Um, I can't remember how much it was, but it was you know it was in the ten late tens of thousands, and um, and we had the money ready for it. But when the regional head of special branch found out that there was going to be some closely hits on between. You know the foot soldiers of the fro and the foot soldiers of the branch, the local branch, that was absolutely squashed um, for for their own political reasons. And as far as I know, that recruitment never materialised. And yet, that's the sort of thing that these people will do. Um, there is always going to be interagency um, uh, competition, um, but but nonetheless, uh, to cut your nose off to spite your face. Um, is is not the way that you ex that that you develop um, uh, intelligence uh, valuable intelligence which is exportable. You you described in the book there. You you said there was um I think the quote was a, an unprecedented flexibility within the field of operations, and, and you also said that, that the DFRU uh, operate like both sides of the board are in, in in breach of law. Well, I I I only ever did it once. Um, truthfully, but there was a reason for it because we needed to. Um, the, a source had reported on you know X, Y, and Z, but we needed to make sure that that was accurate. Um, so the only way we could do that, we didn't have a, a third party source which we could task to go and do that. Um, and um, we we sought. We didn't do it without first getting um, orders. I getting written orders, and that's why I made the point of challenging General Wilsey, who who eventually did accept his predecessors had done it, but he was very clear that he didn't do it. Um, but the um, but it's a five star who has to um, ultimately take that responsibility, and uh, and that's what happened. Now, do have other units cross the border? I. You know, Pretty damn certain other units have, whether that's fourteen company or whether it's two two SES or whether it's deeds elements of the IUC uh, E four L for others. I'm sure it has happened. I mean, you as you know that border is porous. 
um, you know, and, um, it is what it is. I, I had my first date with my now wife as a as a fruit uh, in at Rossi's Point in Sligo because it I had a, had a picnic there. So that that border didn't pose any operational challenge. What do you mean? What do you mean when you say like an unprecedented um, flexibility within the field of operations? Well, because um, it, the period that I'm referring to there is after the Enniskill Park, which is when Margaret Thatcher puts out um, essentially that there, there are no limits to, uh, from a financial point of view, what resources we needed. So that's when um, the fruit becomes a force, a force unit for the very first time. And... Um, and we get dedicated resources like helicopters, for example. Um, and and the carpool changes markedly. Um, uh, access to um, all sorts of weaponry, which hitherto wasn't available, becomes available. Um, so that the, 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 you know the um, the uh, the want of a word. Um, the gloves are off after Enniskillen, and it just happens to be coincide with the CEO at that time was also a very aggressive Scotsman, and and that was a perfect storm, for want of a better word. And that's when you look at what happened a lot with the contentious cases. Um, it, it sort of arrives at, in that period. Uh, how's it going, everyone? Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to uh, to ask for your help, actually, uh, as the audience. My aim here with the the troubles related uh, episodes is to present like a well rounded, uh, well rounded and multi perspective view of uh, of the troubles of of the conflict in the north. And um, if there's anyone living that you think I should speak to, anyone who may have been passed to to do an episode about, there might be a book on it. Um, any instances during the conflict, um, for example, I'm trying to get in contact with the survivor of the, the Kingsman massacre, um, any other types of like professions or anything that, that you think I'm overlooking, in the future I'll be speaking to uh, XSAS, XFRU, uh, Bomb Disposal, um, I'd like to speak with um, with like the wives, uh, like a wife or two of, of Republican prisoners, just, just to get their kind of angle on it. Anything at all that you'd like me to cover, um, some kind of theme or force within the conflict that that you think that you think should be explored. Um, my email is in the description. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, um, drop a few uh, comments. I'm, I'm all ears. And um, same if you're listening on podcast. Um, there's a, on Spotify at least. There's a a little thing where you can you can put in a suggestion. Um, thank you very much. I, I do hope you enjoyed the show. If you do, please subscribe and leave a like and um, share it with someone who, who you think might like it. Anyway, back to the episode. Thank you very much for listening. At any stage during your time with the FRU, did you have to do any uh, like shooting or or did no. this kind of action shit that people would think? No, about? no, never. Never once. I mean, the closest I ever got to being, I, I was petrol um, because there are occasions where we need to go into, um, into green uniform. Um, and um, and and to do reconnection. So I, I, you know, I give, give you an example. So if 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 you've got a source who lives in say uh, Strabane on you know the Ballycoman estate or somewhere like that, and this isn't I'm not I'm using that as an example. This isn't the case, but it, it's it, it's that area, and we may have a a. Uh, a method of reconnecting because in those days there weren't mobile phones, and so actually having level of communication is 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 not easy. But let's say, for example, that uh, you you had to chalk a sign on a, on a very obvious place, and when this person comes out of his house in the morning, he sees this, he knows that he has to make contact with us because we're not going to go and knock on his door. We're not going to go and be that obvious because his his phys physical security is paramount to us. So there are all those of things um, which um, have um, are, are included in the way that we would operate. But the, the closest I ever got to being shot 
was via one of the people in the office who had a negligent discharge um, late at night who uh, essentially, um, and it came through uh, that you know, they were dividing offices and uh, and the fine for that was two cases of beer. So that's the closest. So no, never, never were. Again, it, it, it's not the job of a handler to put himself, uh, that's the skills where we have, where we, we would organise um, everything in a professional way. And to contrast that, the IUC would pick up uh, their agents in their own cars from school or places of work. It is, that's how people get killed and were killed. Um, but, you know, that didn't happen with the fruit. And this is why I take great exception to, um, you know, the, the so-called experts like Eliza, Bunningham, uh, whatever her name is, um, um, she was on the uh, on a podcast with Alistair Campbell recently. Um, she was the former director of MI5, and um, she basically, I, it was, she, I, I, I've got a little bit of a quote here that she said. Um, so she said, um, the running of Informer Statement was a bad operation. That I would agree with. That would have been aborted at an early stage under her watch. Um, added for the first time her organisation knew about the spy, Scapititi, was when they were asked to resettle him after he was exposed. Well, that's a lie. And every document which is generated by a handler then goes up to the ops officer in, in, uh, in Lisbon, uh, in headquarters in Northern Ireland, where there are uh, two separate um, um, civilian intelligence officers, one specifically dealing with the political side of it and one dealing with the military side of it. And um, on the uh, distribution list for all documents, it clearly shows um, the security services and Stormont and the head of special branch. You know, they can't deny that they have knowledge of it. So for her to to um, you know that they didn't they weren't aware of it until they were asked to reset them is it's a perfect lie. It, it's absolutely as clear as that, and it's part and parcel of the you know the game of uh, a subdiffuse trying to uh, confuse the uh, the fog of war. Um, but trust me, she is telling porky pies there. Um, uh, either that, or she doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, because, as I said, you know, we used to handle their phones out of our phones. So, um, you know, the um, I'll be I'll be as nice about that as, as I can be. But she, it is clearly, absolutely, hundred percent, she is either mistaken or is lying. One or the other. Interesting. Okay. See, so, um, I, I wanted to ask you a good bit about your your time, like as a handler. It's it, it, it's it's one of the more yeah. fascinating, one of the more fascinating aspects of your career. What was the actual like day to day of it like? Like, I mean, if you were to make a rough pie chart of like how many of your work hours were spent okay. in the field or doing paperwork, yeah. Or that. yeah let, let me let, let me give you a, you know an an idea to that. So, if you take um, say, so Derry as an office, Derry was. Um, essentially, the largest office was was uh, was uh, East Dead, which is Belfast, uh, in in numerical terms. So, I, and I can't really, um, uh, I don't know very much about their operations. I don't know very much about their agents in that sense. But in regards to Derry, we had roughly uh, one, two, three, four, um, five handlers. Five actual handlers, and then we'd have uh, two collators. Like in my first tour, I'd be one of those, and we would do the core handling for a lot of it. So we would do the donkey work for the handlers and that sort of thing, and we do the pick up and drop offs, and um, and then we would have a, a, a boss, and we'd have a, a second boss, and we'd have clerical support, and we would have uh, engineering support for the vehicles. And um, uh, and then uh, essentially that that was your 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 office, and then 
we would have the best part of say 30, 35 people on the books, agents. And um, obviously not every agent has to be met weekly. Some agents have to be met occasionally daily. Um, so so the, um, the logistics involved in a pickup and the drop off and, and the actual meet um, are, are, are really important to, to understand. And, and this is why it's really important because <laughs> what people like John Boucher don't explain to people is that a debrief is not, it's not undertaken in an environment like uh, Joe's Fish and Chip Shop where you're having a cup of coffee and you're having your dinner and, and, that you know you, you're, you're talking quietly over a table, and you know somebody on the next table. She, you know, everybody is reluctant to discuss things. These are done in an environment where we have control. So we had uh, debrief, what we call DBCs, debriefing centres in the community, and we had debriefing centres in um, in our headquarters. So we had the means of bringing people back to the headquarters in a safe environment uh, and we had the means of picking them in, a, in, a, in an ordinary vehicle and taking them. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't be able to, in an ordinary vehicle, bring them back to the barracks because somebody would recognise them as they're coming through. So we would have secure locations where we could debrief them. And in those debriefing centres, um, um, you, you have the ability to discuss um, every aspect of the case in depth. But the most important thing is that is recorded and you have somebody externally who is monitoring that and also making notes because that's what we do as professionals. Because you cannot, in a debrief, actually, uh, you, you cannot uh, take in every element because the other person may well be able to go away and check something and then come back and basically be in a position to come back and retask or reevaluate that source to to provide some context to whatever has been said. So it's really, really important that the person monitoring is really on the ball and the recording, you can subsequently, it, that becomes a classified document and is then stored um, for posterity and, and, and as, as the documents which have, have been used to generate that intelligence in the same sense. Now, throughout, um, um, Canopa. I've never, never once heard them um, detail any of the recordings that that is available. Not, not once. And um, as we know from Stevens, Stevens had already said that the documentary evidence, a lot of it, had, had got through. It, had, had basically been weeded, um, not only in the Nelson case but also in the State Knife case. Canova are on record of saying a lot of the material which wasn't disclosed to state uh, to Stevens, they've been able to access certain amounts of it. Now, the, the reason that I, I copied you into that email, because I noticed in Canova, I, uh, he uses a figure of 90% available record. Now, he doesn't detail what they are, um, but as you know, I've challenged him thus far, not only me, but the Irish Chinese have challenged it on that point because I fear Mr. Uh, Boucher is being economical with that truth uh, because I know for a fact most of the documents were were, uh, were weeded uh, but the documents he's referring to I think are other agents who are reporting on on steak knife so you know you might have IUC agents reporting on it and he's relying upon that in the figure of 90%. Now, I've asked for, as you know, in that email that I sent to him, uh, specific, um, I'm not asking to disclose anything which would be classified. I've asked him the percentage which remains because the one thing the army does uh, in absolute doses is we have an audit trail. And that is classified documents, they have a life. And when they die, we have a clear chain. We know who's originated it. 
We know where it's gone to, where it's been disseminated to. We know who's who's had custody of it. We know it's where it's stored. We know who has subsequently decided to destroy it. We know when they've decided to destroy it. And we then know which, which um, let's call it Mod Form 102, which register is, holds that information. And we also know from the master Mod Form 102, the where that registry is held. So we do we do admin beyond belief. So when Boucher talks about um uh 90%, he's talking out of his rear. And he is being disingenuous if he is trying to conflate the available intelligence, which covers the steak knife story, but isn't organic to the fruit. If he's talking about organic to the fruit, that is the contact forms, and he's never once mentioned anything to do with any audio tapes. Not not once, not once in any of those reporting. I mean, Boucher can't even come to the point where he's actually connected the dots up. Forty million pounds, and he can't connect the dots up between the agent and the uh, the state knife pseudonym. Would I be so- sorry? Sorry to cut in there. Would I be correct in saying from what you said that um that like every time or almost every time Steak Knife would have met with his handlers, there would have been an audio recording of it? Absolutely. 120%. I mean, think about it like this, right? When you come, when, so let's say um, one of Steak Knife's handlers, I mean, we're talking about really high level intelligence here, right? So when you come back and you do a debrief to the ops officer, the ops officer himself might want to go over that recording. He might he may be he may have knowledge of other material the handler doesn't know right he, you know he's not he's not going to play his cards fully on that table so he is going to want to have access to the raw intelligence what we call the raw intelligence now it makes no sense if you're going to go to the um, to the to if you think about the cost involved in setting up dbcs in the community right it's Phenomenal. And um, the cost of running the operation is phenomenal. If you're not going to squeeze your orange and that retain your intelligence, you are not professional intelligences. Simple. It's not rocket science, but people like Boucher are not really experienced investigators. If they are, they're poor at the job. In the same way, exactly, I'll give you another. I, I remember me- meeting with you, Ord, 2001, 2002, when the first time I, I disclosed uh, State Knife to, to the police. In, in fact, it was it is request that we discuss that element of it. But to come back to, to the original reason why I, I was meeting Ord, um, it was to do with the Brian Nelson case. But um, they weren't aware that a classified document, when it was generated, had a receipt, a classified receipt. Therefore, it's called a Mod Form 24. So w- when you, you generate, let's say, for instance, a miser, which is, you know, the simple document which goes out. Let's say, you know, Ian Hurst is about to fire an RPG or he's planning to attack, um, you know, the a, a patrol on wherever it might let her do an avenue. Right. So that 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 is an intelligence document. It's called a MISA, military intelligence source report. Now that may go out to a distribution list of say 30. And on, on that, it's a classified document. So it's a secret document. So every one of those documents that gets through the classified post is accompanied by a mod form 24. Because we've got to know that whoever's received it has safely received it. Because if there's been a compromise, clearly we have to take counter compromise measures with the source. So we we know to we need to know what each and every document is. They live a life. They don't live outside of that life. And if any of those units want to destroy that document, they then have to notify the uh, originator, which is me in this case as a handler, uh, that that's been done, and then we can we can then annotate the the units mod form 102 as to what the history of that document is. Now, Ord looked at me as if I had two heads. And I said, well, you know, 
Well, just you know, you can, you know, you don't know if the IUC have had Brian Nelson's uh, intelligence reports. Is that right? Yeah. Well, go and get the Mod Form Twenty Fours. Stupid. And that's what they did. And that's why then the Sunday Times had three crates of, of documents which proved that the IUC had that intelligence and that the, the, the reason that I got involved in it was because the allegation was the crew was a rogue unit. If you remember you back to the, the days when John Ware did the original in the, um, in the Telegraph, the fruit was a rogue unit. That was the story of being peddled by the authorities. Nothing could be further from the truth. And, and the only way, you know, people like me could evidence that fact is go and get the mod form 24s. It's basic. I mean, if I was to go and do an investigation, I'd sit, the, 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 the lowest uh, clerk, I'd sit there and I'd get the officer commanding and I said, you each of the two people separately I say, how does this office work? And I'd ask the same question to the boss. And I'll guarantee you that little clerk, he'll give the most honest answer. And I will catch that fucker out who's the boss and I'll make him squirm. But you, you've got, to, you can't just take what somebody, you know, if, if you go to the unit, um, it's John Stevens was on record of saying, you know, um, we, the, the fruit wasn't an agent handling unit. We didn't have Brian Nelson. That was the first story he got told. Well, you know, the, these are, these are long standing police officers. If you genuinely think that I'm leaving that room with that GLC telling me that pile of shit, I'm sadly, it's not going to happen. You reckon? So, sorry? I was going to say, do you reckon that uh, Boucher actually got access to um, these audio records of Steak Knife at all? I, I, I don't know. Well, the, the fact he doesn't even, he, he doesn't, I mean, evidentially, let me put it a different way. Right. So if you look at the PPS statement after the Canopa, he says there's a lack of evidence or usable evidence, evidential records. So he, so they, so, uh, both uh, Boucher or Op Canova, including New Law Long. And by, may I add, um, she uh, basically believes that there was the evidence for prosecutions. But New Law Long herself knew. I mean, I can go back to 2006 when she declined to investigate State Knife. Um, so, you know, I mean, New Law is not exactly Lily White in this, but she was on the steering committee, right? Now, if, if they, if, uh, the PPS had said that they actually had the recording of the handler and uh, Freddie discussing cases and the the merits of each and every case. Surely and evidentially, you can check, you know, the voice recording, so you can you can match that digitally to to make sure that that is that person then I would have suggested that was pretty convincing evidence which could be used in, in, in a court of law. Now, my supposition from that is that all those records are no longer available and were, and were not available to, uh, to Canova. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Boucher needs to uh, make that very clear as to what he did have and what he didn't have. And that is underpins my, my email to him. I, I want to know what he does have and what he doesn't have. He doesn't need to disclose any classified material, but he needs to tell us, you know, does he have the mod form 24s? Does he have the mod form 102? Does he have, does he have the master mod form 102? And are they still in existence? And from that, we can then make reasonable deductions as to who knew what, where, when and how. But what you don't have is you don't have clout, and he has been deliberately um, obtuse on those points. He, you know, I mean, what what has he got for forty million pounds? I mean, I mean, I'm being honest. You know, I'm I'm absolutely being honest. Um, I, I, in two thousand eleven, okay, so Panorama come to me, and they say. We believe you've been hacked, Ian. 
And we be believe you've been hacked because they're looking for material on steak knife. And um, we, so haven't, who, we haven't got they, a complaint. They, sorry, who's they? They're looking. So, so at this stage, they don't disclose that. But it subsequently turns out it's elements of, uh, well, journalists who are working for the then news of the world. Uh, but they're getting, so, so essentially at that point, that's all we know. Now, Panorama come to me and, and, and it was the Thursday before Christmas and I was lying on, on my couch and I was in a really relaxed mo mode. And um, I'm, cut the, I'm gonna cut this short, but it's, it, it's a really important part of this. So they come to me and they say, hmm, right, um, we'd like to meet you. And, I, and I, look at, I look at the overall situation and I say, do I really want to get involved in this? Do I do no honestly? Do I do I need the hassle? I'm comfortable in life. I don't need the hassle. I've come, I've, I've recently returned back to the UK um, from living abroad, and um, the, uh, the government legal services have recently contacted me because I've come back and they're looking to uh, recommence the um, contempt of court which they had against. Uh, the original order, um, because as you know, I'm still subject to a high court injunction. And to cut long story short, I turned to my wife and I said, you know, do you really, do, should I get involved? You know, but knowing full well that if I got involved, um, you know, Panorama would just give you a little bit of a snippet and then, you know, the donkey work would would, would be laid at my, at my feet. And my wife, in fairness to her, said, no, we don't need to hassle. But I, I'd be in the sort of person I am. Um, I, I let Panorama come and we, we got to know what the gist of it was. And the gist of it was uh, they, didn't, they didn't know very much. Um, this is in 2011. Um, but I knew full well um, that if um, the state was involved, then I'm not going to get disclosure through the courts. That ain't going to happen. So I'm going to have to get involved and use the skills I've got to be able to evidence whatever has happened. That's in 2011. So we finally settled the case in 2017. The, state, the, the News of the World, or News Group's position, was right at the start. We know nothing of what you're saying. E evidence said. The police said exactly the same thing. We know nothing what you're, of what is in that programme and you need to evidence it. And the offenders, that is the hackers, um, did exactly the same thing. So you're faced with a situation where you, that is me, now very few people have got the skill sets I've got. So that I decided, hmm, Okay, on the balance of probability, is I'm going to have to devote some serious resources to this. It took me six and a half years, but six, which is roughly the timeline that uh, Mr. Boucher has had with his inquiries. Now I'll contrast this. So it, the culminated in over a million pounds in legal fees, which resulted in nothing of any disclosure which actually brought the case to a conclusion. But what, what did happen is I, I managed to obtain evidence that the, the Serious Organised Crime Agency had intercepts between the offenders, a very high-level police individual who was confident and did know that I was in possession of material which indicated where State Knife was living at that point. So, but they they had intercepted that. And when um, during Leveson, I don't know whether you're aware of Leveson, there was a public community certificate issued, which meant that that um, intercepts could not be used in um, in the uh, in the trial. But nonetheless. For the record, I still got, and um, so I managed to 
persuade um, people who work for the Serious Organised Crime Agency and um, and others uh, to give me the evidence which ultimately led to the police admitting in a in the document that I've sent to you uh, that they admitted that they had contemporaneous knowledge of 2006 of my hacking of my computers. I also evidenced that the one of the handlers involved in the State Knife case was also a member of Serious Organised Crime Agency and was involved in that decision making. It forced the news of the world for the very first time to admit that they had a vicarious liability, it's never happened since, that the hackers uh, were, were owed a vicarious liability and vicarious liability in English law means that they, they had a duty to them and um, so everybody had to admit based upon the information that I had collected, the evidence that I forced the police, the serious organised crime agency, the News of the World, massive, well-resourced organisation, to admit for the very first time in open court in the uh, document that I've sent to you that they admitted everything that I had um, evidenced in, in, um, in, in the court and they wanted to settle. And it cost them quite a lot of money. Now, let me come. I'm, a, I'm an individual, one person. I haven't got resources of £40 million pounds with me Operation Canova. If you'd have put me in charge of Operation Canova, this would have been fucking done within weeks. Weeks. This is not rocket science, but Canova are there as a vehicle of delay. They are what exactly what Stevens 1, Stevens 2, and Stevens 3 did. You, you know, you, you don't put in charge of this type of investigation anybody who is going to. They're not John Stalkers at this point. And again, I'm sorry if I'm crossing across you. Do you know who John Stalker is? The, the, from, the, from the Stalker like, commissioner? Yeah, yeah, so he was the only real police officer who genuinely tried to do the job of an investigator. And uh, and 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 the likes of um, Mr. Boucher and others uh, clearly don't either don't have the skill sets or are not doing the job that forty million pounds and the and the wealth of experience and people that they've got behind them to go and do it now and yet I can the same timeline can bring the police the serious organised crime agency and news group to their knees and evidence it. Now, just contrast. So I don't really have, you know, I genuinely, voucher is, is insignificant to me. He's just a, he's a moment in time that isn't really doing his job. And he's trying to have a few digs here and digs there, but won't answer the critical questions. And if he does have access to the, to the audios, in, in those days, we didn't have video, but we had audio. Um, then, it, if he does have access and he has submitted them, I do think the, either the PPS or the DPS have some in that review uh, that the uh, family solicitors have undertaken. I do think there are grounds there. Um, they need to go on the record whether they do or they don't. Uh, on the note of um, of Canova, he he said in that report, it's um, uh, what's it called an, an interim report. He, he he said that in in the final one, um, statement statement identity will be dealt with, and there'll be like detail on cases. Do do, do you hold out any? Look, I mean, I, I'd first caution you, but do you think there will be a final report? Um, I I was uh, I, I I was told by by uh, one of the family members of of one of the victims investigated that the. Uh, the families will be getting their own report in two to three months, and, and that the final one will be too. I, I'm just, I'm just taking his word. I mean, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Said, I mean, I'll, I'll push back. But, but, anyway. Even, even assuming he does produce a final report, what else is he going to put in that? With other than the fact, what's the difference between his interim report from in a public interest perspective? We spent forty minutes. What what will have changed in that intervening six months? Um, I d d don't quote me on this now. I, I could be wrong, but 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 I think I think some of the reasons given were that there was um like ongoing cases involving 
um, involving um, I, I, yeah, sorry, I, I, ongoing cases that would be that would be kind of perverted or, or messed with if 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 like the full details were to come out. I, I, I well, think there, there are no longer, now, all the cases have been have ceased, so there is no cases. The only cases which are ongoing are civil litigants. So and 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 on that point, um, I was the person who instigated the very first two thousand six. So when me and Jane Winters, who's the head of the then of British Irish Rights Watch. Um, asked Margaret Keeley to be, she was the very first civil litigant. And she, that was, we, that was started in 2006. We're now in 2024. And that case hasn't even progressed beyond what I would consider to be the first step. So all they, all they have done, um, well, since uh, Canova, Canova has been a vehicle with delay. Even the, even those um, uh, victims now who are coming to the, Conclusion that you know they've been fed up. Um, I've uh, I've realised it's been a vehicle of delay. That then you know, and some of them are even at the point where you know they're um, they may not even be here to to avail of any of the information or or any um, financial compensation which they may be entitled to. Now those civil cases could and should have been dealt with. Way before 2017, when not and over took place. But unfortunately, you've got new legislation in the UK now where we've got secret courts. So each of those civil litigants are not entitled to see any of the material which is uh, generated in there. They, they have to have an, what's called an advocate. So a, a person who is, <laughs> who is under the control of the state who will then look at those documents and say, yes, it's relevant to your case, or no, it's not. But at no time will you see that, that material. So you have to put your trust in that third party. Now, back in 2006, that, that wasn't the case. So those cases should have progressed on their merits back then. But we are at, still at the stage now where they haven't even got a, you know, off ground zero one. It, 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 it's almost farcical, I'll be honest with you, um, you know, that we are where we are. And, uh, and, and even in the final report, if he was to connect the dots between the two, you know, even the dogs on the street in Adderton know that Freddie was. Jer Jerry Adams knew that he was. Um, I mean, it's, it's it's absolutely ludicrous. There've been previous investigations by the Republican movement throughout uh, throughout uh, uh, Freddie's career, uh, where there've been internal investigations into him. Three. I mean, and each and every one of those internal investigations, and I'm not talking in the nineties. I'm talking, you know, earlier than that, where they where they somebody had had a a a, um, a genuine belief that there would have been a compromise. And at each of those internal investigations, thankfully, they were compromised. And he was allowed to continue. We, okay, we'll, we'll we'll talk plenty about uh, about steak knife layer. There's a lot to talk about. Um, ju just quickly, like in terms of a prediction, we're recording this uh, early April. So, like right now, do you think do you think we'll get a final report? Do you think it'll come in the two to three months? I I I, I mean, my own personal opinion is I don't think you'll get it within two or three months. Um, I think the families may well get their reports because I th my understanding is that they've been privately briefed. Uh, upon the the actual status of the of the individual, um, and they have connected the dots together in that sense. So um, I don't know if that's your understanding. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I I mean I know that um I know that the families did meet with Boucher and the investigation team before Canova was published, and they were given like like more information than than the rest yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, my understanding is the the link between State Night and Scapatici was cemented in private. That's my understanding. He also, um, I, a previous guest of mine, um, Seamus Carney, who's 
brother was um his brother Michael was killed by the internal security and and they're they're one of the um yeah one he's one of the cases people. where yeah I understand he he said that um and he 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 said it's okay to it's okay to repeat it but but he said that the Canova team like verbally confirmed that the general narrative the Seamus was putting forward in in podcast it, it my my own was referred to um that that that's generally true and they also confirmed verbally that his brother had been shot by two people and that there was three bullets two from um two two two, two different types of bullets i i, I don't want to get it wrong um but yeah they, they, they did get like more kind of verbal confirmation info here yeah. yeah and 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 that essentially buys that little bit extra time do i think I mean, given the problem that the government will have and you're going to, so let's say three months. So we're now into, um, you know, you're looking then to June, July. You could potentially be moving into a period when you're going to have a, a general election in the United Kingdom. You're going to have a problem with the Legacy Act where the ECHR comes to progression. I mean, clearly not none of the inquiries which have taken, including vouchers, Will our ECHR compliant? That's a fact, you know. So they they are going to get their ass spanked with that sooner or later. So the Legacy Act is the, going to the, end up... the, the European Human Rights the Human Rights Yeah, 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 yeah. So so uh, essentially, uh, that's a slam dunk. They they are going to get their ass slapped with that, and quite rightly. Now, so essentially, if if he was to produce a report. Which publicly linked those, those the the profile and the um, the individual, Mr. Scappatici and Stainhouse, and the offences together. Uh, it's going to be Evan sent to two parties: one, the civil litigants, and the second is going to be those parties that are looking for ammunition for ECA. So Turkey's very, very rarely brought for Christmas. So in, in essence, just before general election, when Labour are already on record of saying that they would repeal the Legacy Act, are you going to take that chance in allowing um, Mr Boucher to release that report? I don't know. I am I'm dubious. I'm looking at it analytically, that's that's what I do. Um the, the balance of probability, and again, uh, you know, I remember um whether he was producing an interim report, that charade went on for 18 months. And I can show you emails between um uh between very, very leading uh, journalists who've been given every assurance that Boucher was going to report in uh, two uh, so we're in 2024 now, uh, 2021, 2022, and and even as as late as last uh, uh, last year, he was going to report September, October, and then it got to December. He was buying constantly, buying time, and I can show you the emails when I have a source within Canova, within Canova who told me. Unequivocally, it ain't happening. And if it happens, the earliest point it will happen is in 2024, and will be there will be issues with it. And Peter Taylor will confirm that. There's an email between me and him where I give him the date in that sense. So you know, I was always doubtful as to uh, Canova, and, and my sources were absolutely correct. Fair enough. Okay, very good. G getting back to your uh, getting back to your handler days. Yeah. Uh, let's say you're um you're a handler in Derry where you were. I'm your agent. I live in Derry. Let, let, let's just say I live in like like Derry City, like like an urban environment. Uh, we need to meet up to exchange info, or maybe it's something kind of a bit urgent yeah. that I need to. Uh, how how how's it go about? How how does meet go about? What what what's in, what what's what's involved? What's involved what, what is involved in a meet? Oh, in in the logistics of a meet, okay. So, so you have you, you have routine meets which have been re have been pre arranged at the last meeting, 
or you have emergency meetings, which were, there is a protocol to arrange an emergency one. So both sides will have a, a mean, excuse me, a means of a of an emergency one. Um, an emergency one can be anything from, um, say, for instance, with Frank Egerton, right? So when the decision was taken to um, to extract him, clearly there had to be an initiation for him to to know that there needs to be an emergency meeting for that to happen. Um, so there is a protocol for that. But if you're talking about the routine meetings, they are normally prearranged at the last meeting and 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 uh, whatever intelligence, as long as it's not um, um, real-time uh, intelligence, which needs to be exploited you know, in the next 24 hours, then that can wait until the next meeting in that sense. So... And involved in an actual pickup is 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 quite elaborate. So you, for example, we, you know we we would have routes, uh, which the um, the uh, the both the handler and the source are comfortable with, because we wouldn't ask a comfortable uh, you know a source to be picked up outside his place of work, or um, in an environment that he. If he was seen there, he couldn't have natural cover to be able to cover why he um, he was seen there. Um, so there has to be a plausible explanation for every eventuality that has happened. And if, a, if an individual has to travel out, and let's say he travels out, but for argument's sake, let's say he travels out to Limit Valley in his car, um, if somebody passes his car and it's parked down a country lane, but it's not in it, you know, why? So you have to cover every eventuality. Um, and then the physical element of picking up is normally done um, um, using vans. Um, and because you clearly a side-loading van allows um, the individual to gain uh, an exit in double quick time and and it is not he's not being observed from the front end now those those vans are also wired for the sound because there are occasions where we have to do a mobile debrief so they also are wired to record that debrief and to be able to um, have um, the debrief conducted um, either on the move with the handler in the back if, if for any reason you, you can't stop or go to a DBC. Um, but for that to happen, you would have um, a number of vehicles that are involved, uh, armed vehicles, which are involved in the scouting to make sure there's nothing uh, unnatural in that environment. And um, you would have vehicles which are covering the uh, what we call it, the uh, the actual DBC van, and and it's exactly the same on a drop off. It wouldn't be the same as a pick up and a drop off in the southern locality, um, um, and un unless there was good reasons where you've got natural cover that that can happen, um, for example, market day, and and then they would walk across to be able to get their vehicle, which is parked up. In, uh, in the cattle mart, Kappa. So you need to have plausibility and deniability if there is a compromise. So there is an art to it. And that's why lazy people, and I mean lazy, unskilled people, will go and pick you up from your place of work or uh, catch you coming down the brandy well. And you'll be surprised in your own in their own vehicles as well. Which has happened in in Canova? Actually, um, uh, there was like six anonymized examples. It, it was under it, it was under operational failings, and they, they they didn't refer to the the agency. I think it was just security forces, but they referred to a time when uh, they picked up they picked up uh, an agent or an informant in a bad area, it resulted in them um, yeah. getting seen. Uh, they they had intel that a particular handler's vehicle 
was known to be to be compromised and they still used it and the agent ended up dead. Yeah, did well, in, in, in our case, as soon as any adverse intelligence on the vehicle, we had a carpool. So literally, um, if it's a serious compromise, I mean, with, with every vehicle, we had six or seven different VRNs, the tax for it. So we could instantly change it or we could just take it and, and exchange that vehicle for another high performance vehicle um uh, always oh um, i shouldn't say this but always four door um but 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 essentially uh, there's always a reason so our multiple unlike the RUCs, um were was absolutely uh top draw and we had the we had um the um the backup to uh in every forward op operating office, we had our own mechanic. So, I mean, there's it. I mean, this is a funny. So, I did a pickup one night in the in the in the um, in in a rural environment on the outskirts of Derry, and my job uh, was to drive the sorty vehicle to a a, a, a better location. Let me put it that way. And I got in the vehicle, and as soon as I put the car into gear, the gear stop came up in my hand. So that then renders that that whole meeting as a compromise because that has to stop. The, the person has to come back and take possession of his vehicle and then organise his own recovery and such forth because the, the meet doesn't take place then because technically that is a, uh, it's a situation you can't recover from because that vehicle can't be allowed to stay where it was. It's a temporary location, pitch black, and I mean pitch black, you know, in the middle of, they are sending over. Um, so, you, you know, there are very few, you know, opportunities for that to happen, but he would have had a legitimate excuse for coming down there and, but, uh, but, and, and and if it came off in his hand, it came off in his hand, but not for me to have it in my hand. Um, so the, 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 those are the sort of things, incidentals that happen in real in the real world, um, and you are always going to get those incidents. Did it ever happen where you were in the middle of um, a, a meet of some kind and you thought, like, I, I'm I'm being I'm being watched. There's something not right here. Yeah, I... yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not. That's where the cover vehicle has noticed something. I give you another funny here. I mean, that, yeah, there are occasions where that does happen, but I, I don't think there's ever been a real case where it was evidenced that because obviously that that affects the security of the source. Um, but one case, um, I mean, and I'm not being disparaging here, but a lot of the people um, are, are are not always the brightest bulbs in the chandeliers. Right. And there was a, a case um, in Fermanagh where the person lived south of the border. And uh, it was the days when there was the uh, coin-operated boxes, you know, the phone boxes. So we would get a call and the, the and the and um, he'd put the money in there and we had to give him instructions. And this, this particular was that, what we wanted him to do was uh, to drive to a roundabout and drive around. We would we would intercept and we he would follow us. Oh, I'm not going to name the roundabout. It's a very famous roundabout. Uh, but anyway, when the covering vehicle went down to scout the area, um, the instruction "We will meet you on the roundabout" got misinterpreted. And he was parked in the middle of the roundabout. And obviously that's a compromise. It's gone. You know, and then you were in the position of then trying to make a recontact. And and, and that's that situation's exacerbated because this person lived in the Republic. Um, and that isn't easy. So it, it it all adds to the um I mean, the amusement, there was, you know, obviously the, the DBC van didn't go anywhere near that because we had bad 
advance notice that the guide fucked up. Um, but that's what happens. These are the sort of things that do happen. Um, and then conversely, um, there was a very, uh, and, and to put the ball on, the, on a different foot, we had a, um, we had the bell rung in, in Derry. Um, and we were, uh, the office was in a, uh, a suite of offices, uh, self-contained, and we would come downstairs and um, uh, we had um, a, a bell and people would ring it. And this particular day, uh, we had a BT engineer come to the door. Now, um, in Derry, uh, a lot of BT engineers were also RAM members. But this particular BT engineer was not just a RAM member. He was a very, very senior RAM member. And this cheeky fucker had obviously got onto the, onto the barracks and whoever's at the gate hadn't checked the ID properly or hadn't put two and two together. And he's come um, <laughs> to the free offices trying to gain access. And, and fortunately, the handler that had gone downstairs was very switched on and recognised him. He was a really, really well-known and politely uh, escorted him back to the, to the gate room. And the pass was removed for him in, and he was escorted off the barracks. But clearly, either he was he was he was very lucky, or he had some inside knowledge where he was going. Did it ever happen either with you or with another um, handler that like your identity got compromised? That somehow they were kind of watching you, and then you, you received info intel that you're going to be targeted, or or, or just that they have info on who you are and what you do. Okay, yeah, me. Okay, so um, one particular person. Uh, I mean, w when you when you're uh, fishing, fishing for uh, fishers of men, um, you you can spend months and months and months and months um, doing the background research uh, before you're in a position to do a pitch, an actual. So it's a bit like a double glazing salesman. You know, the hardest thing is to do the pitch when you've got to do the donkey work and, and you know, try and um, and uh, create what's called a point, um, uh, a point of contact. So somewhere in that person's life, their natural working life, where you've got a point of contact where you can intercept somebody in a secure environment or... Um, create a situation where they become familiar with you and they then twig on what is happening um, and if they are conducive to it, will engage with you. So let's put it as succinctly as that. So um, this particular person was a female and um, a, a RAM member. Uh, but the wife of a very, very prominent uh, RAM member. Um, and she um, was a bit of a girl, let me put it that way. Um, she would, uh, alongside with another girl, was well known about luring um, uh, UDR soldiers and then taking them back to the barracks, letting them know they'd driven them back and dropped these off. So she she was a, she was liked a bit of fun. I don't mean any fun as it's sexual. Right? Like no, 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 yeah, yeah. And, and then she, she, she was well-versed in, um, in being able to um, play the game. Um, but anyway, I worked out that she used to go swimming uh, on a routine. So, as I say, uh, the research goes on for months and months and months. And um, I'm also, because she lives very close to the border, I use one of the PVCP's permanent vehicle checkpoints as a means of actually interjecting with people. So um, in, in green uniform, um, so that uh, they get to hear your voice. And if and when I make the pitch, they'll recognize that voice. 
the eyes and they'll put two and two together and say, I've seen him before. So I had um, I had had some contact with her on the PBCPs over the previous periods, and um, I'd also swam alongside. At the, at the time we would go, it wasn't like open swimming; it was lanes. So she would catch my eye, I would catch hers, and um, we never had any uh, talk, any contact as such, but. I, I was aware she had seen me, and but this particular day, I um, I'd gone back down to the PVCP. I, I wasn't in a position to picture um, because I wasn't confident enough in in it. Um, but she um, she told me the vehicle that I'd travelled there. She told me um, the office number that we had in St. Angelo. She told me which porter cabin we worked from and she advised me not to go back in my car that evening. Wow. So from being the hunter, you can quickly become the hunted. And and why did she why did she uh, tip you off? Never asked her. Never had any more contact with her. Um, but again, um, a lot of it is to do with, um, and you find this a lot with in, in the intelligence world, is uh, wanting to get one up on your adversary. Not necessarily wanting to whack you, but um, but essentially, I mean, I thank her. You know, I thank her that she she tip me off in that sense um but it certainly um it, it was a lesson learned did it ever happen where where an fru agent um got, got killed ever no no never there's never been one um one compromise uh, uh or an agent which was uh, ever seriously um wounded um, as I said there was the Stephen Lambert case but he wasn't in a position of danger because we had control over it um, but that's not the same with the RUC they had handlers who were um, who were killed um, but again that comes down to poor tradecraft um, simple as that um, did you ever get the did you ever get the sense that um, uh, an agent or an informer that you were running had been like Reflipped, like I, I'm thinking of uh, in the MRF. There was um the Freds, um uh, Seamus Wright and Kevin McKee, who were found out to be agents and then were were put in as kind of triple agents. Did that ever happen? Uh, not with not. N we did have agents which were uh, what we called to be high risk, and we had one particular agent in Derry who was a brother of an OTR, and every um. He didn't live in the uh, in the uh, north, and um, he would uh, travel so uh, travel to the north infrequently. So we might get three, maybe four hours notice of him coming, and 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 it was infrequently. I mean, he might not come for three months. He might come for twice. In, in six months and that sort of thing, we did. We had no control over this this source, but he was always worth the risk. So you have to balance the risk, and that's why it's really important that even if you have risk, you try and mi mitigate that risk by being in control of the environment. So if it's been a firefight, at least we had some means of neutralizing that firefight, and he certainly would have been at high risk uh, if there had been one. So he's unlikely uh, as, you know, um, took his vote for Christmas in that sense. But nonetheless, uh, you would put extra resources on those cases. Um, and I always question whether they are with the risk, but nonetheless, you know, um, those on higher pay grade than me would take that ultimate decision whether to make that meet or not.
Um, okay, let let me get to uh, let let me get to uh, like recruitment. It's um, it's very interesting. You you mentioned um, you mentioned in the book and, and before before when we were speaking that the FRU much preferred um to deal in in like compensating their informants instead of like threatening them and blackmailing. Yeah, it, it's not that we would prefer. I know of no agent that was, and I mean I and I mean this honestly, absolutely hundred percent. I know of no agent. That was ever, ever um, his prime motivate, or indeed any motivation was was blackmail. It's not. It's not a skill set. It, it, if you're if you're blackmailing somebody, it it, it is what it is. You're you're not going to have longevity. You're not going to have confidence in what you're being told. Uh, you're you're going to have doubts. Um, it, it is not a uh, motivation. Which is uh, to a professional intelligence uh, um, in any way, shape, or form. Probably. You you said in the book as well that um once 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 you start paying people uh, money regularly, they they become a bit dependent on it as yeah. well. Yeah. So thirty or seven is a classic case of that. So Willie Carlin. Um, I mean, we regularly we used to have to it, um, there was fallouts over money. Um, because people get used to a certain level of income. But we have to make sure that that income doesn't um, doesn't impact on their security. So it, it, in, and it's difficult for them because, you know, I mean, if you take Willie Carlin, I mean, Willie Carlin, God rest his soul, he's gone now. But w w Willie Carlin... There's a lot of myths about Willie Carlin, but Willie Carlin was the manager of the A scheme. The A scheme was a building site within the governor scale. So when when he was being used by the collators to cut their teeth, uh, this is before um, he got. Well, he, he never had access into the Republican movement, but he had access into uh, elements of the uh, of Sinn Fein and their. Uh, uh, their political direction. Um, hence the reason why Michael Bethany got involved with him uh, in the early days, because they believed it would have a political dimension to it. So um, if you can imagine the manager of a, um, one of these schemes, the A scheme was essentially people who were unemployed. They would get paid from their dole an extra amount so that they go and do some work in the local community and, and that sort of thing. And he was the manager, he was the key holder. And occasionally uh, we believed um, some of the leading Republicans would use that key for nefarious reasons. So he that's where he was of interest to it. But um, it, it's um, it, when if you were to give, um, I mean, I'm off the top of my head, I can't remember what he was on now, but but let's for argument's sake, um, in the early eighties, he was on a hundred pound a fortnight, you know, argument's sake, and and then suddenly his his value was um, to increase, and he he got paid on. Um, uh, on the value of information that he was to give us. So if he was to say to us that uh, one of the McNaughts family who lived on Osterbano Road, leading Republicans, was going to put some equipment in the A scheme, he would get a bonus. But how do you comfortably um, have confidence that he could cover that bonus? And and that therein lies that risk. And that's why we invariably had bank accounts for our agents. So we did they didn't always get their earnings up front. Now, in the to, to give an example, I know of no case in the fruit situation where those were never honored. But I know of one very a famous case in the RUC with Joe Fenton. He had a uh, 20 grand built up in uh, a savings fund and when he was um, murdered, 
uh, the IUC basically denied all knowledge of it. And if it hadn't have been for a brave, very, very brave handler in that case, that money would not have got to its, where it should have got to. Could you um uh could you give us like a rough kind of estimate of like let let's say let's say you try to recruit uh ten you 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 make initial contact with like ten potentials like how many roughly are be would actually end up becoming an agent reformer and and how many of them would 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 kind of work out like medium to long term? Okay, let let, let so you you ask a very um fair point a fair question, but it. But let me just put it in these terms. So in the early 80s, um, the ability to recruit was much easier. And, and the reason behind that was that we had the um, uh, we had the advantage of having had some contact with people during um, uh Who'd, who'd, who had been in a position where they had had been um, scooped up, for want of a better expression, and just taken off the streets in the early days of the Troubles. And um, so anybody who had been in that position, there. Uh, had been attempted to be debriefed and there'd been some correspondence. As the troubles progressed through to the eight to so the middle eighties, eighty seven, eighty, eighty nine, it's my opinion that the IUC had a deliberate policy to try and strangle us in regards to that is the proof. Uh, they didn't they preferred not to have us in uh, operating in their environment and so the uh, the number of um, of uh, confirmations that we could make a recruitment dropped to maybe one in a thousand to that to that level and and that was um, he had that power you know, I'm not taking away from them, but that that for me was a conscious decision for them over time to um, to strangle us. And I have my suspicions that the Sandy Lynch case, when the thumbprint was found on the battery. In the Joe Fenton case and many others before that, CID would have been kept a thousand miles away until everything was sorted. So there would have been no potential for a compromise. In the same way they did with the, the murder of Mr. Panukin, CID were kept at arm's length. In the Sandy Lynch case, The fact that the uh, the thumbprint of Scapacici, um was found on a battery, in my opinion, isn't plausible as being uh, an, as being anything but a deliberate ploy to compromise that agent. Let's say let's say you're trying to recruit me. You've done the bit of research. You you think that I'd be a good um you know potential candidate. Um, when I'm when you're talking to me and talking about the money and incentives and blah blah blah. Wh wh when I say to you, listen, um, the IRA when they find out about informers, they will arrest them, so to speak. Um, they'll drill into their fucking kneecaps, pull out cigarettes, beat the shit out of them, torture for a week. What's gonna happen if that happens? Uh. If that happens to to me, like what? Where, okay. how, how do you reassure okay. them? Okay, I, I mean the honest answer to that is, and and to give you an example of that in real terms. So when we got the direction in the case of Franco Egerton uh, that we wanted him 
or we, our direction was to get him to get alongside uh, Martin McGuinness in Cable Street and to make himself available um, and to become actively of value to, to him. His first concern was clearly for his own physical welfare. First and foremost, because he genuinely thought he'd get fucking beaten up as soon as he approached, because <laughs> uh, that was his belief. And I'm and being honest, it was also, um, no, it was also mine and the handlers, Frank's, because uh, the handler was also called Frank, um, uh, opinion as well that he was likely to get uh, at least manhandled when he uh, when he made that offer. Um, and then um, when it transpires that he was um, welcomed when he made that approach at, uh, in Cable Street and he was brought in uh, to the bosom, he then quite rightly sought assurances that we had his, um, uh, that we would be in a position um, to know if there was a risk to him and whether that we believe we could mitigate that risk to him. And that goes for every agent who is, um, who is, is for example, who's green boot, who's in an operational role, he will always, or she, will always want to know that, um, uh, it's a bit like having a drone, uh, they want to know, or a satellite, uh, they want to believe that they have uh, that you have some insight into what will develop and that you would have some preemptive intelligence to mitigate that risk. Now, uh, as I said, that did happen in uh, Franco's case and we gave him that assurance on more than one occasion. And um, that is um, not given lightly and from a handler's perspective, it's meant. It genuinely is meant. And um, when that isn't discharged, uh, that is um, two things. One is uh, that it's counterproductive for any other agent who has been given that assurance. And secondly, it demoralizes the handlers because the handlers uh, do not play lip service to that um, uh, affirmation. When you, when you give that, you give that in all honesty and you truly believe that that's what you and the organization will uh, will discharge. That's a contract, for want of a better word, between you and that agent. And in Franco's case, that didn't happen. In his second, in the, um, not on the original one, but on his return. And uh, those powers, the not the handlers, but those um, in a uh, privileged position, um, undermined that. And that is uh, to the detriment to all intelligence operations. Um, and when a handler goes into that room and gives that assurance or that uh, comfort, he's got to be sincere and he's got to want, he's got to know implicitly uh, that the assurance he is given on behalf of that organization, it will be carried out. And it and it, it's not you know it's not a, it's not subjective it has to be. Um, let's say again let, let's say you're recruiting me, and I'm kind of on the fence. I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, look, okay, uh, plenty of things can go wrong. I can get found out in ways that that wouldn't be related to your incompetency. It, it could just be like like bad luck in some cases. Um, what do I say? Or what what do you say to them when you're like, okay? What what happens then um, if I do get found? Let let's say let's say I get yeah. found and you can you can pull me out. My my life's fucked. I can't go. I can't go back to anything normal. What, what like like what are you gonna do? For yeah. yeah, I mean essentially, if if, if you again if you you take case examples rather than dealing hypotheticals. 
So if you look at Willie Carlin's case, he, he got resettled three times. Um, so uh, because there were, there were, it's a complicated case, but but nonetheless, um, that that happened, and uh, and you have to provide the reassurance as best you can uh, that you will have eyes and ears on him, and you will you are comfortable in the fact that you will have advance notice of any any risk. But I'll come back to one thing. It, it, it's I need to understand you. I need to understand what makes you tick. I need to understand what would ma- motivate you to give that information. Is your is your motivation revenge? Is it anti violence? Is it, it? There's a whole host of factors which may or may not be um, the reason why you are giving that. Uh, um, and 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 it's complicated. No two cases are the same. Would would it be the case like like obviously like, like Willie Carlin what was a fairly high up um intelligence source? He, 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 he wasn't, he wasn't, no? You know, he wasn't. That's the thing. <laughs> Willie Carlin uh, had he had uh, Willie Carlin had access to um the Sinn Fein element of Derry Byron uh, of, of Derry Sinn Fein, and he, for a very short period he was um sort of the treasury. Uh, treasure. Um, but militarily, he had nothing. And the only thing he would be, uh, uh, we would see advance any documentation or any leaflets were being pre- uh, prepared um, um, by a, um, the head of Sinn Féin, Mitch McLaughlin at that time. So Mitch would um, um, had a dual role um, and but, but we, we would get advanced intelligence upon what was in the Sinn Féin thinking. Sinn Féin was in its infancy when, um, uh, in the early 80s, it it wasn't what the sophisticated modern political party it is today. It was a completely different beast. Uh, they were uh, chickens running around with no head and no organisation. And <laughs> But as you know and remain, they're subservient to the army. So... You know, you can't be the leader of Sinn Féin without, uh, without the acquiescence of, of the of the uh, of the Ra. It's as simple as that, and um, and I, no doubt it's not dissimilar to that. So um, it's a subordinate organisation to the Ra, and um, and if I don't go and put this battery on here, I've just noticed, and we're going to have a problem. So give me a moment. I'll go and grab my. Okay, so right yeah, to come back to 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 Willie. Um, Willie. You said he um, actually wasn't that high up, yeah. No, no. I mean, not at all. He was only in. Uh, in he was from the governor scale, so I, so essentially within Sinn Fein in Derry at that time, they were in their infancy. Um, militarily, he had no. Um, no value. Uh, it was purely political, and it was at the time really when uh, security services were taking an interest in the um, um, in the progress of Sinn Fein. Few people could see the the acorn as it grown, and it became, as it has today, really important. Um, so intelligence on the political party now is um, is extremely valuable, uh, but by then, uh, especially to an organisation like the Fru, he was seen as a pain in the ass because he wasn't adding anything to the party in a military sense, and um, very few of us had any interest politically. Okay. Um, again, let, let let's say you do recruit me, and I'm. Passing information, just a couple, a couple of weeks, maybe two months, and let's say I get rumbled, um, and it was only like it was only low level stuff anyway. W- would it actually be worth it to to, yeah. just, to go through the financial cost of like? Yeah, yeah we no choice. Life? We have no choice. You know what we're going to do? I mean, you you can't name a you cannot name a source in Northern Ireland other than Frank Hegarty. Uh, that we've ever let down, or, or indeed has been uh, stiffed. Uh, you can't with the IUC, um, but you can't with us. 
Um, was was Kevin Fulton with the FRU? I can't remember. Yeah, but he wasn't stiffed. He 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 is out, and he is. Um, yeah, he's in a position of um, safety. It took a lot of fighting to get that position of safety, but that was because, and, the, and remains, there's politics between agencies. And um, so the complication with the Fulton case is, um, and this is fairly common with uh, a lot of sources, they're not just handled by one agency, but if you take Kevin's um, situation, he was handled by... Um, and not a lot of people know this, but by Customs Intelligence, uh, CID, um, uh, Branch, Fru, and elements of the of the security services. So he was meeting handlers from like these several different agencies, different periods, and he burnt bridges with some and and and. That in itself, um, if you look at the news reporting in the 2005-2006 period onwards, um, the one person who made a positive contribution to the safety, and, and, and all those agencies, none of them, want to actually put their hand up and say, well, we'll pay for it. Okay. So that becomes a conundrum because there is a... You know, a large financial uh, outlay when you resettle an agent, and a lot more than what what people understand. Um, but in the two thousand five, two thousand six, two thousand seven onwards, um, the one person who did apply some pressure uh, was Yuard, um, uh, Peter, uh, Kevin had um, threatened to um, uh, to uh, chain himself to a, a police station in Belfast. He'd already done it to customs in London and uh, and got arrested for it, uh, but was never prosecuted because the judge said, you know, I'm not going to prosecute him because clearly he's got a valid case. You do need to look after him. But anyway, so he turned his attention then away and, uh, and you all didn't want the political distraction. So um, in a very diplomatic way, he let it be known um, that uh, uh, Fulton should be taken care of. Okay, very good. Um, speaking of recruitment, we, we, we talked a little bit about this off camera, but um, uh, I, I, Richard Arrow, who I, uh, who wrote the most recent book on Steak Knife, his, um, his belief, he, he said he's not 100% sure anything, but uh, his belief was was that the steak knife was uh, was recruited because he got caught um, with like a, a building a tax scam thing, and and they were you did they would use it against him. Um, you 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 always maintain. Uh, well, I, 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 I don't. Yeah, I can't, I can't see that because one, it would be no value to us. The only person or the only organisation that would have that knowledge is uh, is the RUC. Um. So and they would use it for their own nefarious reasons. And the second reason, which is the, uh, and forgive me, but the gentleman that you you uh, uh, you had on your podcast, who was the author of the new book. Uh, um, Richard Ward. Yeah, he also makes the point that it wasn't in the DNA of the of the fruit to, uh, to use um, uh, a blackmail as a, as the primary motivation, or not primary, any motivation so it doesn't fit um and bear in mind that state knife was run for the best part of two decades um it's unlikely uh given that motivation um that he would have run for that longevity with uh that motivation you um you you're still like you you're still of the of the fairly strong belief that that he was he was a walk in that's my understanding. Um, I didn't. I've never had any access. See, the the, the 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 absolute truth is it's contained within the original contact file. So uh, every meeting. Um, so if, if it was a walk-in, um, he it would all be documented. So that the 
the true um, story is there or would have been there for all to see. Um, I was never privileged enough to have seen it, uh, but I, but unlike many others, I was privileged enough to know the handlers. And my understanding uh, is that it was a walk-in. Um, but, but as I say, um, others may know better, uh, but I doubt it. Fair enough. Um, I was... I was cautiously optimistically hoping that um the canova report would uh would shed some light on it w did, did you expect it to or would you expect the well, final I mean, I, what do i expect for 40 million pounds i expect a lot more than than i've got if i was not looking if i was looking at this as a member of the public or or the victim's family i'd feel shocked me personally i would feel shortchanged that there is nothing in there which hasn't been in the news really Okay, or unless you can think of a top line, or using a journalistic term, what's the top line in there? The top line would be um, a, a very ambivalent. Uh, there is more people, uh, he cost more lives than he saved. That's the so-called top line. Well, even that is worthy of analysis. Okay, so, you know, let's say, for example... Um, it's a profit and loss in, a, in an accountancy uh, environment or in a business environment. Um, so it, essentially um, what Mr. Voucher is saying in, in, in a roundabout way is that as far as he's concerned, more people uh, were, um, were badly affected than were positively affected by... Um, the activities of State Night. Now, he's using, I think, it varies a figure between 14 and 19 murders. I think my, my own personal opinion is I think State's probably closer to the 30, 34. But it's let's take... Being, being, being responsible. Yeah, yeah. Well, or, or involved in the, in the actual event or had knowledge of. Uh, the planning and execution of, but but let's assume the fourteen that he is he is um, uh, that they are confident they they can lay a glove on. So, um, me personally, I, I can think, um, unlike the Brian Nelson case, I can personally think of three cases where he saved uh, the life um, of uh, an agent. Uh, given as advance notice. And the unquantifiable um, aspect of this is it's not a binary situation. And I'll add to that by saying this. The destabilizing effect of an agent at a, the upper echelons of any organization are unquantifiable in regards to how it affects that organisation. So just taking the numerics, and Mr. Boucher knows this. This is why he's playing semantics. It's a, it, it, it's a very um, shallow card trick. Um, and, if, if, and, and in contrast, um, and I'm going to give a defence here, so John Stevens did the same thing. So the evidence that was given by... Uh, Gordon Kerr to uh, the Brian Nelson case was uh, Gordon Kerr uh, alleged on oath that there had been many, many tens of lives. I think it was into the realms of 100. Um, and then uh, that was subsequently investigated. And um, Sir John Stevens on record is saying that he considered bringing um, um, proceedings uh, for perjury. Uh, because uh, he could find evident, not evidence of one. Um, so even if he found two, it certainly wasn't into the figures of tens. So the, the, the contrast is that in Mr. Boucher's case, it, it's, there is no meat on the bone. All you've got is a skeleton. And what you would want for forty million pounds, I'd want fill it stay. But I've got skin 
and bones and next to nothing else. And I think it's genuinely, and, I, and I'm, and I, you know, I mean, but me, me and Boucher, I've got a, a bit of a history. You know, I, I took tasks with him right at the early stages and he wanted to make meetings with me. And I told him, you know, I will meet with you, but only when you substantiate to me that you're a man of action. And to get a long story short, uh, he offered at the start, halfway through and towards the end. I declined all because I'd, I'd seen no evidence of his of his uh, serious intent to investigate this because I ran agents with him and reporting on his organisation and knew exactly what he was doing. And I was always comfortable with the fact that my initial analysis was correct. So, hence the reason why I always videoed my interactions with his, uh, with his investigators. And a, a few of those have been played on Panorama and such forth. And I don't do that. I didn't do that for any other reason than that's my tradecraft. And, and, you know, that's what I would ex expect, uh, he would expect. And, um, and ultimately, it gives a, um, an authoritative position of who said what, where, when and how. Because I don't trust Mr. Boucher. And I presume Mr. Boucher doesn't trust me. But where, where I ask him is to put some meat on the bones. And that comes down to the simple things like the documentation. What do you have and what don't you have? Because only upon that, if we have clarity, can you take a reasonable position? You yourself, John, can say, right, well, if he's only got 50 to 60% of the documents which we, we know were in existence, then how can he come to an informed position on almost any, any subject matter? You know what I mean? He, he can't. And, and that, I feel, is probably the reason why the PPS has said lack of evidential quality is there because they will know there's an audit trail. And Mr. Boucher doesn't touch on the audit trail. He doesn't say what what we know was in existence, what we have today. But fortunately, I have them on, uh, on uh, recordings admitting um, that um, the figure I have is between 50 and 60% uh, of the Scapatici document. And that leaves a really big chasm, um, which uh, is, uh, is, 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 is certainly incomplete for him to take any authoritative position on almost anything. And you can be assured, you can be absolutely assured, uh, the handlers, um, are, they're skilled people, they're not going to be interviewed by the police and give them anything which is um, going to incriminate themselves. Um, and neither is anybody in a position of management. So you're not going to get any help from them. So the only thing that he can rely upon is either Mr. Scapicici giving an honest, in-depth interview on the record, under oath, um, uh, having been cautioned. Uh, uh, and that didn't happen. Or they have the documentation and they haven't got that. And if Mr. Boucher wants to take issue with me on that, he can come back and correct what both me and the Irish Times believe, have asked him, which is to confirm that element of it. And I hesitate to guess here, John, but I, I will gladly go and show my ass on Preston Town Hall Square if he does do that. Um, just to just to wrap up the Scapacici uh, recruitment thing, um, what 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 reason uh, do you think, or you'd have some reason to believe that he would become a walk in? And um, I, I it, it was interesting. He he was interned obviously in the the early seventies, and he actually could have gotten out early if he just signed a thing saying he wouldn't like associate the IRA and stuff. So 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 earlier on, it actually looked like he would be a, a yeah. more staunch. On, on, yeah. On. yeah. So my understanding is there was a a severe beating. And that he wanted to take uh, revenge. Now, of all the motivations, of all of them, that is without doubt the most powerful. This this being personal revenge. Yeah, but personal revenge then moves forward 
And if you listen to the um, the Culloden Hotel, uh, the Sylvia Jones, and uh, if you listen to the venom that is in that recording, the way it is delivered, um, that in itself is a subliminal message in regards to who he feels as. Uh, has wronged him. And there were those, um, including Richard Arra, who who he, he said was pretty convinced that uh, the scap had some kind of um, had some kind of like deal, or maybe had dirt on someone s- such that um, he, he he felt safe that he would never be exposed because because then he could uh, he could then expose others. Do, do, do you think? I, I, I don't. I don't. I don't subscribe to that. And what I do know for a fact is in the Brain in Buchanan, I know he had conversations with uh, the Brainy Buchanan uh, legal team in the Republic in regards to giving a statement in regards to his role. Uh, but it, uh, and my understanding from very good sources is that in turn, the state, that is this state, said that if you were to do that, you would lose your, your, your two things. You would expose yourself to civil litigants, which we wouldn't defend you, and you would have to cover the legal cost. You would also expose yourself to criminal liability, uh, which would also then um, put you in a position. So in other words, all the way up to his death, the state uh, paid for his legal fees all the way uh, throughout this. And, it, it, you know, he had so much to lose and they had so much over him in the sense that even um, even his estate, let me put it that so when you die, you have an estate. Now, have you seen any probate for that estate? Have you seen any legal papers for that estate? I mean, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see them probably if they existed. Oh, or not. You would if you went through probate, but equally the the lawyers. Would, would have been entitled to to see that from a disclosure point of view because if Mr. Voucher puts two and two together and connects the dots, then that estate would become liable and would have become liable when he was a living entity, never mind a deceased entity. So there are legal reper- repercussions which allowed the state to apply pressure as I say, Green and Buchanan, I know for a fact he was in tentative negotiations with him. I, d- I genuinely think there was a point in time where he wanted to get it off his chest. That's my understanding. You you said earlier um uh Scap Steak Knife was was ra- was an agent for, for 20 years. That that that's not um I I don't believe that's the I, I, common... I, I said, okay, so I, I believe what timeline do you think he ceased to be an agent? ceased um being an agent i i couldn't tell you the year but but i think when um you think sandy lynch i, I i'm i'm not i'm not sure exactly off the top of my head where to place that but but when yeah, but when, I, but when I staff started getting like down, ostracized within the i era. think he stood down from the through in from the through as in the um i think he stood down in in the middle of 95 middle of 95 okay and 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 people Without, he's certainly active in '94 after the um, Derek Martindale murder. Now, Sinn Fein would have you believe he was stood down after the Sandy Lynch case. Which um, one remind us? Well, Sandy Lynch case was in '91, but then he goes on the run to Don, to Dundalk. He then returns in uh, early '92, and that's when he's he's arrested, but the subsequent gets off. And Sinn Féin would have you believe as soon as Sandy Lynch takes place in, in 91 that he stood down, uh, but, it, but that's a lot of bollocks. And uh, for whatever reason, they want to set the face. But what is interesting is if you read Richie R. Raw's book, in um, one of the um, um, contributors um, uh, details a meeting in the year 2000 where he attempts to enter a, a meeting and he is 
uh, is uh, uh, presence is declined by the senior Raman uh, because ultimately what they were discussing was elements of uh, the internal security unit and the way it affected. Um, so uh, it would seem to me uh, that you were either very ballsy or, or you still have some currency that you think you could still get into that meeting at, with in, two, in the year 2000. And then you've got the subsequent defences, which were put forward by both Mr McGuinness and Mr Adams in when the original book comes out. And um, if you remember the famous Sam Cadwallader and Barney Rowan interview, which was, you know, you know, uh, and 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 the defence is uh, uh, advanced by both uh, uh, by Mr. McGuinness and Adams were uh, were let's say um, were well thought through, uh, but uh, were, were still a positive endorsement. To, in other words, the allegation is that it was faceless securocrats who were doing this, and and but Sinn Fein, oh sorry. I won't say she been. The Republican movement knew full well, and if you were to ask um, uh, Patrick Wilson as one person whether there had been suspicions about Scapatici in the 80s, they will tell you if they're honest. And senior Republicans know that there were... Um, other instances where it had been brought to their attention. Now, um, it's not for me to second guess why uh, certain things are swept under the car carpet. That's, I, I, but at the end of the day, um, neither Mr. Adams nor Mr. McGuinness, um, especially Mr. McGuinness being his day-to-day -day boss, um, would not have would not have known um, uh, that there weren't previous uh, accusations. And if you, again, come back to the Sylvia Jones tape, if you listen to the venom, uh, because he is absolutely saying that the order to have, uh, for him to um, organise the murder of Frank Hegarty um, was on the instructions of Mr McGuinness. That's implicit what he is saying. Uh, so he is, and he's not to know that that is being secretly recorded. He is naive, but he is frustrated. For him to have done that, it is, it's madness. Um, and he was clearly not thinking rationally at that time. And ultimately, if it had just been for the book, my, my book, I think he'd still be there now. Um, I think Republicans were prepared to put up with, um, well, certain leading Republicans were for, for obvious reasons. Um, but once the rank and file heard that tape, literally within minutes he'd gone. Not I, hours, minutes. I, on that note, we, we, we'll go back to your your, your work as a as a handler. Um, again, let's let's say you're running me as an agent. And um, you get some kind of intel that, like, I'm suspected in some way. It might not even be uh, in in like a serious enough way to to say, okay, that they actually think they actually think he's um, he's an agent. But of course, like especially in the early eighties, like a lot of fellas were suspected who weren't, and you know there, there was a kind of a house of mirrors going on. If you're you're, yeah. you're my handler, you're my handler, and you get some kind of info um, that maybe they want to they want to take me in for interrogation or what? what like, would you would you offer? Okay, well would you often but, tell them? What you have to factor in for this, right? It's not guesswork on our part. Because we know, because we own the ISU. So when, when the local unit does an investigation and they report it up that chain, we have the ability to affect the, um, the transition from serious to very serious or to reduce that because other material can be introduced into the chain of events. So it, it, having 
the control of the in, um, uh, of the internal security unit is a really I mean, it's a, it is without any shadow of doubt um, the one area of any organization that you would want to penetrate uh, because you know everybody who's been recruited so all the new bloods coming in you know everybody who has been suspected at a local level and how that investigation is progressing and to the point where I mean, the local unit aren't going to stiff somebody and carry out an investigation uh, because it will, the ultimately, if the, if the sanction is death, it's got to be pronounced by a, a member of the, uh, of the Provisional Army Council or, or a representative. So therefore, it's got to have had come through the, the good offices of the Internal Security Unit, which ultimately... Um, uh, Mr. McGee and uh, Mr. Scappatici were at the forefront, and and you you made reference to uh, uh, to Mr. Fulton, um, and so he and the local Newry area was used on a couple of occasions to be a driver for to, for Scappatici when he was down in that area, um, so um, and as you know, the internal security unit had a thirty two county right wide remit. It wasn't six counties. It was a GHQ at a 32 county row. So Scapacici would be down in Limerick and Cork, the whole gamut. I mean, he spent the best part of two years in, in Dundalk. Um, and obviously Dundalk, South Armagh. Um, there was some story about him not being trusting, uh, trusted by South Armagh, but I don't, I don't know that that's true. And if he and, and if South Armagh truly believed he wasn't to be trusted, um, uh, you you would you mean you, you'd have two big beasts going head to head. So you'd have Martin McGuinness voting for him, and you'd have Slab saying he's not to be trusted, and you would see open conflict in that sense. And I, I don't I see no evidence of that. Um, I think uh, I think it was Henry Hemming in his last book. He he referred to um this thing called like a spy master's dilemma. Where you might have a particular source. In, in fact, in, in fact, it applies to Frank Haggerty's case. Um, where you have a particular source, and he's giving you information about a bunch of guns or an attack or whatever. In in, in Franco's case, it was, it was a bunch of guns, and you're then left with um, you're then left in a predicament where you can you can swoop them up straight away, but but it'll be dead obvious kind of who your source is, and now it's gone. Did did, did you find yourself okay, in, well, trying to make it? Right. There have been three other uh, shipments. Uh, previous to the one that uh, six um, at the, uh, I mean, I mean, generally speaking, the, the, well, the, the I mean, this, my, my point is, it, it in, in from a handler's perspective, uh, we, if if we just if if we um, compromise that agent, let's say you know a another agent, and and it, it's his first time, and we just bag that that arm um, shipment, yeah. We, we can't go back to the well. We've spent years cultivating him. And the first thing that happens is a compromise. He's gone. So what are we going to do? Spend another two years being in an intelligence vacuum? No, we want to use that so each of those weapons can be electronically tagged, jabbed. And we can use that intelligence um, to, um, to know the locations of the hides, the dumps, and uh, to potentially... Uh, use that intelligence in a, um, or for other agencies to use it in a more um, operationally effective way. What was um? What was on the note of Frank Hegarty because you you were his handler for for a time anyway. Um, what was he like? Just kind of uh, as an agent to deal with. I got caught up with this one because I I I um. I was pretty close to him because we were both. I like a gamble on the on the greyhounds, and I used to own greyhounds. He used to own greyhounds. He used to raise them, and he he also um, we, we were quite similar in many ways uh, in in our likes. So we got on very well. Uh, but I coined a phrase within the office that I call, and you probably don't remember this, but there was a character on Coronation Street called Stanley Ogden, and. And and I called him 
Stanley Ogden and Stan Ogden. And uh, when, um, and in um, the, uh, uh, some of the initial uh, Sunday uh, Times uh, papers and in, in the first manuscript to the book, I referred to Stanley Ogden. So one of the clerks who worked for Through uh, North, uh, he was a clerk at the time, um, uh, gave a, a statement uh, when I was arrested. Um, and he, he, he subsequently is a police officer in London now, um, uh, that I was the only person who used the term Stanley Ogden. So they used it as a means of, of um, confirming that I was Martin Ingram. And so, so that was another piece of the strand that they had in there. Uh, but he was not um, um, and I'm going to I'm not going to be cruel here, but he wasn't the brightest bulb in that chandelier. Um, but he was streetwise if you get my drift. But unfortunately, um, when he was when he was in um, uh, his resettlement, he wasn't happy, and um, that was plainly obvious. And um, in the same way, uh, Willie Carlin, Willie Carlin got phone calls from McGuinness um, directly, uh, giving him assurances that he he could come back and he would be safe. And Willie Carlin was too. <laughs> too clever in the sense that you know I remember him saying to me um, not a fucking cat and nose chance but I trust uh, Mike McGuinness um, and that was never going to happen but unfortunately in um, in Franco's case oh, okay and just on that point there was a recording of one of the phone calls between uh, McGuinness and um, and uh, Willie um, so we managed to get one of them uh, on and that was given uh, to the boss, and um, and ultimately the team that was dealing with um, with Franco, um, one of them, uh, one of those people was the person that me and him failed in Squad eighty five, and so he was one of the other ones, and. Um, I'm not sure, hundred percent, whether they had, um, had done the same thing, uh, taking the recording. But I do know for a fact that he was contacted, and he was, and his family were cultivated over a period of time to give him the confidence that um, he could come back. And one of the handlers described as a homing pigeon, and that. He just wanted to go back to Derry and his life that he had previously, and that was that was naive in the extreme. Uh, but ultimately, that does not absolve the Fru's responsibility in knowing, because clearly we knew he was in a position of danger, because we had Scapatici, uh, we knew where he was, and the IUC knew where he was in uh, his hideout. Um, the family had been given separately assurances uh, by Mr. McGuinness that he would be safe if he returned. Alongside that, which I think if you read the Richie R. Roebuck, you will see again, when I, um, 20 years ago I wrote about this, there was um, extreme pressure within Derry City Pyre internally um, be, because the one and only person who sponsored uh, Hegarty was none other than Martin, and therefore um, he was coming under pressure as to to explain. Um, so the the the, the, way, the only way that that could be alleviated, um, or the quickest way from his perspective, that is McGuinness's, was to have him um, dealt with. Um, but that, in my opinion, would need the conscious acquiescence of at least two agencies. I'm sorry, so, not to. Not to jump around on topics, it's just I, I want to ask before I forget. You you said earlier about about you guys running the the ISU, the, the Notting Squad. That, that that's kind of well known. Um. Uh. Could could you give uh could you give even like a rough figure of how many 
agents FRU had within them or what percentage of the of the top Nutting Squad fellas that, that were agents for you? Yeah, but, but, see, the Nutting Squad was a very... Um, Loose. Uh, uh, let me just... Uh, fluid. Fluid. That's the word I would use. So in Belfast, so if you, if you look... It, so if you look at the Sandy Lynch and the Joe Fenton case... So, um, in um, so the, the reason Morrison got off his case is one hundred percent linked to the fact that, and the in the book, and I allude to this, uh, that the uh, the judge in the case had not been as he, as is required for him to be in full possession of. Uh, of any agents it, along uh, who were present. So take Scappatici out of the equation. Um, there were multiple other agents also involved in that operation. And that had not been disclosed to the defendant's legal team or to uh, they're not required to the defendant's legal team, but they are to the Diplock uh, the Diplock judge, who ultimately has to be in possession of all the facts for him to make. He's the only one. To, there's no jury, so he's the only one who can consider the rights and wrongs of all the positions, and that's why he was admonished. Was uh, it? It's not. It's not like official or anything. That there's people who who strongly suspect it. Um, but but I, I wouldn't state it for a fact. Uh, but John John McGee. Not in my knowledge. Okay, really, you 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 wouldn't have anything indicating that he was he was an agent or an informant. Not, not in my knowledge. Obviously, he's an ex Royal Marine, uh, but but I I don't know. Um, I don't know whether he is or he wasn't. Um, you know, um, I don't know. Um, but I do know there were others involved in those two cases. Of course, of course. Um, John, John Joe was a useful idiot in many. Um, so he was all he was a figurehead, but not really, um, not really operationally effective. Okay, okay, fair enough. But back to um, back to actually actually like like handling handling agents. W would you uh, would you take on like almost a different personality um, or just different aspect of your personality when meeting with like a particular person? With I, I assume there would be agents that you like. They would they would operate better if you're like friendly and and bubbly and stuff with them. And there'll be some probably who who prefer like a more serious fellow because it would reassure them. Okay. So so what you have uh, essentially is you have a handler and a co-handler. So you have to work out the dynamics of the individual. And norm what normally happens, you have a good cop, bad cop. So you always one of you always has to retain the trust of the individual because throughout it's like a marriage. Throughout the life, there are turbulent periods where uh, somebody has to take um, a, a chastising role, for whatever reason it might be. Now, if that develops to the point where you have to get the boss involved, we has happened regularly with Willie Garland, because the handlers had no, um, no leverage, in that sense, between um, it's complicated in the Kelly case, but uh, they didn't, so they would have to get the boss involved, and then the boss we'd have what's called the boss meet. And again, if you listen to the General Wilsey case, I take issue with I've never ever seen a boss meet of a general ever. I've never seen a boss meet of the CEO or the fru ever. It just never ever happened and I could never envisage it ever happening. But that's what he was he was he was being used by um the CEO through uh, as as giving reassurances to State Night when they had that meeting that I called him about um, that um they had his best interest at heart and he uh, General Wilsey was convinced he went back to work after that in an operational uh, role. Um, now, a 
a boss meet only has so much uh, value, so much leverage, um, because ultimately you've got, you've still got to retain that relationship with the with the agent uh, that is the handlers. So there is, uh, like any human beings, any relationship you have ups and downs, um, and but between the two handlers, and in, and in and in if you take um, Scappuccini's case. This is how important that relationship is. So he essentially had four handlers throughout his years. Uh, two in theatre, two out. The same two come back for, for two years and then go out for two. So ultimately, continuity is absolutely paramount. And that is why um, it's... Um, you can't afford to do that with every agent, and I don't know any other agent in the crew that had that luxury. Um, um, of that, of that four of those four handlers, um, how, how many did you know personally at, at various stages? All of them. W would it have been common for agents? I, I know you're you're probably not supposed to, but like you know, in, in your own time to just kind of kind of talk about your cases with each other. Um. Well, yes and no. Um, we we would do a bit of their donkey work for them in regards to so um, we do a bit of their research because obviously uh, it's a massive job. He may come back with a whole reams and reams of work, and and it's just not that the artist to be able to get that material out fairly quick, and they were understaffed um, in the admin side of it. So we would help. We wouldn't know anything to do with the individual, but we would we would know, you know, for instance, we'd have to be doing research on Spike Maria or whoever it would be. And um, you do get that. But where you do have, um, in, in, in my case, once, they be, or once one particular handler becomes aware that I know the identity when it gets compromised through the DUI, uh, we played football. Uh, most weekends together, um, and we we would socialize. Um, but I can't say he gave me um, a running commentary or anything like that. You know, he he was professional in that sense. Uh, but invariably, he can't put that genie back in the bottle. You know, that's the truth. Um, um, and it and that's what it is. It is uh, uh, once it's once it's done, it's done. Okay. Um. We'll fast forward to we'll fast forward to an interesting moment where you purchased a, a very good book written by an ex IRA man, um, called Killing Rage by by Eamon Collins. Um. Do me a favor there. Can you just like, can you outline what dots got connected when when you read that book? Because I, I I knew, yeah yeah sorry like 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 what what did you know before that book and, and what did the book uh provide provide like a link with? Oh okay so. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's page two three six or two seven six. Um, that's tattooed on, on in in that book in the Killing Rage. I, I can go get it there if I have it there if you want to. Uh, yeah, I've got it. So let me. No, in fact, it's here. It's, it's never it's never far away. And, uh, uh, and, and it, it was it was a Notting Squad chapter, right? Yeah, there was yeah, one. It's it, 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 it's the it's the. It's the page that deals with um, him boasting um, to uh, that is Scapa teacher of boasting uh, about um, taking a uh, a convicted volunteer uh, who believes he's going on to his his family and um, and their lap uh, their. Um, uh, taking him down some steps, and he genuinely believes he's going back to his family. He's been cleared, and they get to the bottom of the stairs, and he nuts him. And he, that, he, sorry for for any Americans, he shoots him. He shoots him in the head. Yeah, yeah, he shoots him in the head. Now, um, <laughs> perhaps I've come a little bit late to the party in that sense, but for me, that 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 translated. Um, given that I knew Eamon Collins was not aware of the identity of State Knife and his role, his true role, and that Eamon Collins, who um, uh, was deceased at this time, 
and uh, and he'd written this in um, in all honesty, um, which, which is an excellent book, uh, but one which was likely to lead him to uh, to his death, um, which he did subsequently. So I thought it was without any shadow of a doubt likely to be an honest and impartial um, uh, recount of what actually happened in that scenario. So I came away from that, and, it, and again, perhaps I'm a little bit late to the party, but I came away with the belief that we were looking at a psychotic serial killer. And, and, and what immediately struck me, and again, perhaps a little bit late, uh, was that um, I, I immediately turned the, the, the coin over and, and looked at it from the handler's perspective. And knowing full well the coverage that other agents have on that, that individual stake, um, the, the likelihood is that the handlers would have been aware of the risk to that individual. Uh, and uh, but secondly, into the actions and the way those actions played out. Therefore, I felt a moral indignation that the handlers would have taken place in that conspiracy to murder, or at least would have had knowledge of it post the event. And yet, we still have that individual in place today. Um, at that point, um because I genuinely believe he was in place at that time. I now know he probably wasn't operationally active. Uh, this is in 98. So it was one Saturday morning, and I will set you the scene. I'm in a bookshop. My wife, um, I, had a, I had a three-year-old daughter at the time, and my wife and my daughter uh, were uh, went shopping in Watford City. And I found a little bookshop which had never been in in my life and I was enjoying a coffee and it was what it was the time before um, um, the, the modern ones where they'll allow you to read a book and have a coffee alongside everything it was it was so chilled and relaxed and a, and, a, and, a, and it was really good and I was in a really good mood it was Saturday morning the sun was shining and I ended and I'm not ashamed to say this but I ended up having a tear in, in run down my face because I had a conscious realization um, that you know I was part of part, I, that organization that I believed um, um, allowed a psychotic uh, serial killer to to run a mark um, is. Um, I have some moral responsibility to that. So it, it was in 98 that I decided to start writing a book. Uh, and so, so, sorry, no, just, just think about it. like, like uh, you, you knew, you knew previous to reading Killing Rage that there was a fellow called Scapatici that his, uh, that, it, that his code name was Steak Knife. That, that... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew I, and I knew, who he was referring to in the book. Uh, so when I picked up the book, Killing Rage, uh, and you look at the back, I could quickly work out the figures, uh, the people that are involved in it, because he's in the back of it. Um, and then um, I was reading it through, not expecting anything like the situation which was recounted by Eamon Collins. And, um, and then... That that was a um, a pivotal moment for me in that sense. Um, it was an epiphany. You know, it, it was generally a point in time where, um, and 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 as I say, and it comes back down to if Mister Boucher has the documentation, which evidences even that event, and he. If that documentation still exists, and and the audio tape uh, re, um, confirms what is in the both the contact form and the misers, um, there's a lot of hips here. But if it does, then I, I would I would with with great respect 
um, want to know why in 2002 you ordered and um, Stevens didn't um, um, didn't action uh, the uh, the investigation into State Knife, although he accepts he was informed of it by me and the circum and he knew who he was, what he was. Um, and yet that investigation just appears to have played lip service. So if you look at Boucher, Boucher's having two bites, at, you know, the, the, the state is having two bites. I would ask, why was it not progressed in, in the early 2000s um, to the point where, he, he, I mean, the, we have public inquiries for much less than this sort of thing. Oh yeah, okay. So, so in Canova, um, your your book actually gets referred to. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the only yeah. book that gets referred to, and it says, um, the no it, come, come again. You talked about the North Antonia. Yes, I, I was going to ask you. Did they? Okay, so so in in Canova, it just says, um, oh, there's a tear in that book. Yeah. Brian Nelson yeah. once did a name swap thing, and, and they just simply said this is not true. No, no explanation or nothing. Well, they, 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 it, essentially, it comes back to the same thing. Um. If they don't have the full file of Scapatici, if they don't have the Brian Nelson case file, which he makes no reference to the Nelson case files in there, so that the targeting, the initial targeting, that information comes directly to me from the handlers, that that happens. Never seen it written down, but that comes from me. But for him to take a definitive position... He's not in a position to, he can't even take a definitive position upon the status of State Night. Never mind whether the North Antonio case is linked to it. And yet he wants to take a whack at that, but not without putting any meat on the bones. So again, Mr. Boucher, you know, you know, and, you know he, he, he is what he is. And he's just, um, I'm going to be I'm going to be kind here, but he's just a vehicle of delay who is taking an opportunity because me and him have a little bit of a history between ourselves. But everything um, that I have said from day one um, as as proven. I mean, if you if you cash your mind back to when the first uh, meetings of um, of state knife was put out. The Republican movement rubbished it. The state rubbished it. This the the that we have had concoctions. State knife himself um, threatened to um, uh, to have a, a defamation case against me, which I would have welcomed. Um, he then wanted the state to prosecute me. Uh, it's in the third affidavit the, uh, with um, Jane Kennedy, the Secretary of State, where he said I owed him a duty of confidence. Um, and I communicated to Mr. Scappatici that I would fall on my sword. In other words, I would admit I did owe him a duty of confidence, but I could only possibly owe him a duty of confidence if he was the serial murder Scappatici. Um, Mr. Scapti declined uh, to, to avail of that uh, opportunity. Um, but Mr. Mr. Boucher um, has, right, has written a report which is very binary. He doesn't explain the context of what he's saying. He doesn't explain. And that's the reason why I asked him to clarify the 90%. Because if we're talking of the 50%, 60%, which I have the Canova investigators on record as, Right, if that's the accurate, but he's using 90% because he's conflating other intelligence, then he is being disingenuous. And potentially, um, I may well look to action that at some stage, but we'll see where he comes back with it. Um, but I would like him to put a little bit of meat on the bones in a nice way uh, in, in regards to... Um, what the truthful position was. And if you also notice, um, Keeley, he doesn't deal with the legal framework that the FRU operated within. Nowhere in that document does he deal with the substantial. 
a substantive position about the legal framework. Um, Eliza Cunningham, whatever her name is, Buller, she does say there was no legal framework until 1989. But the offences that he um, uh, is investigating cover a period when there was no legal framework. So it was a wild west. So ultimately, what Boucher doesn't do in, in any of the subjects that he has raised in his interim report, he may well deal with them substantively in the in the full report. But, you know, I'll hazard a guess that that just ain't happening, Boris. But anyway, you know, I mean, you know, Mr. Boucher can prove me wrong and good on you if you do. But he asked me to judge him at the culmination of his investigation. I've still got his correspondence uh, where we generated between the two of us. I, I've kept that in confidence. But at some stage, we'll deal with this. When he deals with his full report, I will deal with that forensically. But let's see the meat on the bones first. Um, Interesting. Okay, very good. Um. Again, th thanks for all the time. W was there anything? Was there anything that you wanted to mention today that that we didn't get to, or or anything like that? Um, or, or just anything? Or just anything you want to leave the audience with? Any any final thoughts or words? I think, you well, know, I mean, when you've been at this game for um, 20, 26 years, um, it's been um, most of what. Um, is, is already out there in regards to Martin Ingram. Um, but I'm the only one, the only one that has kept a straight line and was certain about what we wrote about right at the start and uh, we've kept true to it. And it will be, you know, I, I sincerely believe, and I, you know, figuratively speaking here, I think when Mr. Boucher puts, if he was to put the dots between the two, he would do it, you know, through um, gritty teeth. Because essentially what he is confirming is that uh, I was right. Now, you know, as I said to you right at, you know, uh, early on, I don't see that happen because of the civil actions and the ECHR. My own personal opinion, and I might be wrong, but I don't think you'll, you'll see the, um, uh, the final report this year. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that prediction, yeah. That's um, Sorry, no. Um, I, on that note, you just remind me, is there any, is there any claims in the book um, that you might have thought were true or accurate at the time, but new, new information come up. Is, is there any in the book you wouldn't you wouldn't quite stand by anymore? Well, it's not what what went into the book was just enough to get it through, and to to make what what you if you can imagine the Martin Ingram story. This has been um, um, a journey which has been a bit like urban warfare. I I couldn't come out. And fight um, a, on a, on an open battlefield because I would have been taken down very very quickly. So what I've had to do is a bit like the IRA in the sense I'll come out, we'll have an operation, then we'll retire, and then we'll come back out and we'll retire. So I I have been sniping for twenty odd years at this, and you you when you're taking on the state. It's never an equal fight. And, and it is what it is. And it's the only way I could do what I have done. Um, but when when Mr. McGuinness and Mr. Adams said, uh, face the securocrats, uh, both of them gentlemen knew full oh, well they weren't face the securocrats. And, and that's, the, you know, the, the, I, I would hasten to just say to Republicans, Look back and look back, uh, not with rose tinted glasses, but just look objectively and analyze past events. And, you know, and, 
and in the same way I would do. Um, we 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 discussed whether whether you think Martin McGuinness was an agent or in form of some kind. What about Jerry Adams? Do any thoughts either way? No, I've, I've got no. My my own personal opinion. I I think it that it would be highly unlikely. Uh, Mr. Adams is um, for a number of reasons, that, um, but yeah. I'd be, I, I would be very, in fact, I would go as far as to say I'd be categoric in my opinion in regards to Mr. Adams. Um, Interesting. Sure. Yeah. Well, Does... I'm, not, I'm not a fan of Mr. Adams. I'm just giving you, as, as I see it, um, there are certain things which have happened over the years and I truly don't see it. Okay, very good. Um, again, thank you very right, much. John, you're welcome. And I'll, uh, I'll go and get my Sunday tea. Do, do, do. Yeah, so I, I, I've kept you long enough. Okay.